Hey, Michelle. Hello. Are Paolo Santiago, Maya D. Raisin, and Claudia Hopelman all interpreters? Um, I I can't see the waiting room. I think you have to add me as a co-host first. Yeah, first. So more meet co-host. Meet co-host. Okay. I don't know the names of the interpreters, so it says there's eleven waiting, so they can't all be interpreters. Right. Oh, I I see Robin, so we should. You want to let her in first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, let, let me, let's see. When, what was, Chris, Christina said she was going to join, right? Once she logs on, then she'll be able to tell us who the interpreters are. Okay, I can send her a quick email now. Yeah. Hi, Robin. And then you're the only person who can make other people co-host. So you have to make each of the, um, okay. like you would have to make Robin a co-host. All right, Robin, we're just trying to make sure we can identify the interpreters because we already have folks in the uh, waiting room. Apparently, Claudia is someone from the interpretation office that's joining us. I'm going to guess that's Claudia Hoppelman, so I'm going to let her in. Yeah, I just let her in. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, oh, did you let Alex in? No. Oh. Alex tried to join before. Four or two. Remember when we were talking about right. there there is someone in the interpretations office whose name is Alex. So I'm wondering if that's him. But let's see. Um, hi Claudia. Hi. hi. Hi, are you with the interpretations office? That's right. Yes, I am with the T and I unit. Okay. Um, I'm Michelle. I'm with FACE. So our meeting starts at 630 and we want to just first let in the interpreters and our, um, our CEC members. And so I'm going to make you co-host and then you can see the list of um, the people in the waiting room and just admit in people who are in the interpreters. Mm -hmm. yeah, so could you please just admit minute. the interpreters and not everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay. I don't know the name though. <laughs> I'm still waiting to hear back from, um, I don't have the list of it. I'll, I'll, okay. I do have the, the Spanish interpreter's name. Okay, I see Cantonese Mandy. So she's, I met her before. <laughs> she's a Cantonese interpreter. So okay. I've let her in. And then Maud, everyone I'm letting in, I, I'm not sure about Alex, if you're there, could you just um, mention your affiliation? Cause we might have you mixed up with another Alex. Alex, can you hear us? All right, Alex is also video only, so 
For Alex is connecting to audio according to oh. the box. Oh, great. Okay, so we'll give it a give him a second or her. Um, yeah, but Maud, if you could make at least Claudia and Mandy co-hosts, that would be great. Um, and Tom as well. I'm sorry, Michelle, you said oh. Cantonese. Mandy is Cantonese, right? Yes. All right, thanks. Okay, I think we actually lost Maud. Oh, there she is. Maud, are you there? Maud, you're on mute. Maud, are you there? She's on mute if she is. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Shino. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? Good. Let's see. We're letting in the interpreters early, but we don't know what their names are right now. And so hopefully we'll find out soon. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, oh. Mandy. Hi, my name is Mandy. I'm the Cantonese interpreter, but I'm having trouble using my phone to call in. So can I talk from here? Um, yes, so you will be talking through Zoom if someone on the Cantonese interpretation line has a question. Um, but in order for them, in order for you to do the interpreting in Cantonese for them, it has to be, you would mute yourself um, and you would do it on the phone line because we can't create a separate room within Zoom. Understand. And what's the phone number? Can I see that again? The screen just disappeared. Um, yes, it's it's in the email I sent. Could you just give me your uh, school's email account and I'll send that to you? Oh, I don't have a school's email account. Okay. Or whatever email address. Oh, okay, okay, sure, sure. Uh, Mandy Ng, M-A-N-D-Y, mm -hmm. N-G, mm -hmm. 02, at gmail.com. Okay. I'm emailing you right now. Thank you so much. Um, Michelle? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, yes, I have Ying. She's one of the interpreters from Mandarin. She okay. She's in the waiting room. Yes, so I can admit her in, um, let's see, is she Ying Situ? Hold on a sec, let me ask her. Ying? Hi, Ying. Ying Situ. Are you able to see her? Yes. So her okay. name is Ying Situ? That is right. Yes. Yeah, I'll admit her in. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I see Christina, so I'll let her in as well. Um, oh, Maude, are you there now? Yep. Okay, um, so we have a couple other people to make co -host. Yeah, I just made Gino a co-host, and now I'm making Tom Rockledge a co-host. Could you also make, so Christina Poncel is now here, if you can make her yeah. a co-host. And number you're generally yeah. outside of your plan and will incur a one cent per minute charge if you continue. You can hang up now to avoid the charge. Welcome. This service is provided by freeconferencecall.com. Please enter your access code followed by the password. Um, Mandy, could you just mute yourself right here? Oh, I'm going to mute you. Um, and then can you make Claudia and um, Cantonese Mandy and Ying Situ co-hosts as well? They're the interpreters. Yes. All interpreters, please have the language as the first word in your name. 
So it would be like Spanish, Yaelin, for example. Um, hey, Christina, it's Michelle. We have a large waiting room, so I'm just admitting in the interpreters. Could you let me know the names of those that are missing right now so I can pull them from the waiting room? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out who's missing. I emailed you the name of the interpreters in that email, so I don't know if you see the email um, list. Okay, let me pull that up. Ying, do you want all the interpreters made co-host, Michelle? Yes, because that's the only way um, they'd be able to, and, and we can still mute them, right? But that, it just gives them the ability to unmute themselves if they need someone to repeat something for interpretation. Or, yeah. Right. Ying, um, do you know how to sit to, do you know how to rename yourself to the language you're interpreting? Let me unmute you. Oh, I'm not sure so she's there. Um, Maud, can you make Ed and, oh, where, oh yes, and Ushma co-hosts as well. I did, I thought. Okay. Not me yet. And you're, you're Hello, you're can right. you guys hear me? I this is so. Ying, I'm a Mandarin mm -hmm. uh, interpreter. We yeah. can. Ying, could you just rename yourself so that um, your Zoom name has Mandarin in it so people know that they can message you? Uh, how can I do it? Um, uh, so the way- Oh, rename it? Okay, I got it. Okay. Michelle, I'm sorry. This is Mandy, the Cantonese interpreter. I'm still waiting for your email to try to call in. I'm sorry. I'm doing like five things at the same time, so I haven't been able to. Um, but if other people who are co-hosts and CC members, if you can check the waiting room and just make sure we're letting in all the CC I've been members, checking. I'm checking okay, now. Then I will email Mandy. Yes, you email Mandy. I've been checking for other CEC members. Okay. Hey, Maud. Yes. Is it okay if I do a public service announcement about the decorum in the chat at some I, point? I've already written it out and I'll do it. Okay. All right, Mandy, I just emailed you, so you should have it in a minute. Um, and then what I'm going to do now, Christina, is just look in your email and admit in the the interpreters, which actually you should be able to do as well. I think we have you as a co-host. Um. Uh, nobody answered me though on uh, as far as being able to speak after the second speaking session. Can I exercise my power to address everything in the chat? To address everything in the chat time, there might be four hours worth of things in the chat, right? Like I don't. Just give me as I, much time as everybody else. That's all I ask. Yeah, uh, I think right. yes, hundred okay. percent. CEC Thank members you. have the right to to speak. Thank you. All right, so the Spanish interpreters are in. They are Paula Santiago and Yalin um, Montiel. Hello. Hola, como estas? Bien, gracias. Qué bueno. <laughs> Christina, are you there? Are we limiting public sessions, uh, public speakers to one minute? Yes, I, we, uh, uh, I didn't see it in the email chain. That's what I asked. Claudia, I, I just, I just admitted Eric. Can somebody make him host, please? Yes. Claudia, I think we lost Christina. Um, so I think all the interpreters are in the room except for Hang Ying, Amy, Hui Li. 
Um, I'm not sure if she has just a different Zoom name, but I don't see her right now. Um, but the other ones are in if you usually do some kind of, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so there, everybody's in at this time, okay? Great, I don't, um, Christina's coming back on. Okay. Hey, my computer takes me on. No, I'm on a different computer. Do you want me to make Christina, uh, Christina, can I, should I make her a co-host? Yes. Thank you. Christina, all the interpreters are in the room except for Hong Ying, Amy Hui Li, and maybe she's in the waiting room. I just found the other ones very recently, um, but I, I, I don't know if she's under a different name. Okay. Am I able to see who's in the waiting room? Oh yeah, I can. Um, I know sometimes they've used really random names and we've, we've asked for that not to happen. Let me reach out to the vendor to reach out to them. Alex, could you just identify your affiliation, please? We might have you mistaken with the Alex in the Department of Ed. Um, Maude, could you drop Alex as co-host? Because I don't think yeah. that person is who we think he is. It's not the Alex from our office. Okay, that's that's the Alex. I was thinking of Alex Santiago. Maybe on the meeting. <laughs> Most permission. So mm -hmm. I don't know how to remove someone from to put to put them back in the waiting room. Um. Oh, I, I can do that. Do you want me to do that? Okay. Yeah, let's do that. And we'll admit everyone at 630. Okay, so this Zoom room right now is just CC members, interpreters, and DOE interpretation staff. Oh, came back. I don't know. How can someone come back from the waiting room? I think he got admitted, what, or he, she got admitted when um, we were both trying to admit people because the list moves so fast. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if that just happened again, but let me just. Do you want to remove Alex? Once removed, Alex will not be able to rejoin the meeting. Oh, so I we don't want to see who that. it is. Yeah. Whoever is Alex, can you let us know who you are? You're so in? there's a function to put him back in the waiting room. Yes, that's what I did, and then um, like they back up. up. Oh. Yeah. Want to try that again, maybe? I just did it. Okay. Put him back in the waiting room. Okay. I, I don't see any other CEC members in the waiting room at this time. Are we hearing of anyone who's having issues getting in? No, no, not on my phone. Okay.
Oh, we're at 93 already. Is that legible, guys, if I hold it up like that in mm -hmm. terms of people being able to see? Yeah? All yeah. right. So those are three people already that are PTA or SLT. Obviously, if there's electeds that come in, I'll put them at the top. So unfortunately, we have a lot of interpreters in this meeting who have not worked a previous DOE event, um, especially with Spanish and Mandarin. Or I'm sorry, not Spanish, for Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, so um, for the leaders of the meeting, if you can try um, to avoid DOE jargon a little bit more than normal and spell things out as best as possible. Um, for my Mandarin interpreters, do we have both on here? If you're a Mandarin interpreter, can you speak up? Make sure you're yes. unmuted. Oh, is here. Hi, Dongfang. Hey. Can you please change your name to say Mandarin and then Dongfang? Yes, I'll do that right now. I see. Uh, do we have uh, Ying? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Hi, can you also change your name to say Mandarin and then Ying? Okay. Okay. No problem. And um, have you guys received the script for this meeting? Okay. Yes, yes, I receive it. Yes. Okay. Dong Feng, you're muted if you're trying to speak. Yes, I received that. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Cantonese interpreters, who do I have? I see you, Mandy, trying to speak, but you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? You're still muted, Mandy. Mandy, if you can hear me, you're still muted. I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I thought it would as well. Can you hear me from the phone? Um, we are starting the phone line right now. Okay. Um, are, have you already gotten through? Yes. Okay, you, you're already through? Okay, so I'm, I'm joining that now. Um, where's our other Mandarin interpreter? Do we know? Oh, you mean Cantonese? Amy? Yeah, she's, she's on too. Thanks. So I can't find Amy um, in the waiting room, Christina, but perhaps you can. Um, I'm not sure if it's finicky for you, but I can only see three names at one time. So it's a lot of scrolling through like 126 names. I only see like three, maybe four. In it. Well, yeah. Um, but if you <laughs> search and admit her and that would be great. Maud, could you make Lana co-host? Exciting. Please enter your PIN on the mobile. Thank you. There are two participants in the conference. Lynn and other council members, can you please add CEC member to your name so that uh, uh, you know that you are uh, a CEC member? Um. So on the uh, Ushma on the box, you right click on the box um, where you see the three dots, and then you can rename it's the third thing down. Uh, one of the interpreters, the uh, Mandarin. Interpreter. The box with your picture. Sorry, Michelle. Yes. So one of the interpreters, uh, Dong Fan Mandarin, she needs to call in to the line. Uh, Phone interpretation line? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to call right now. Yeah, all the interpretation is done over the phone because we can't have it like in this Zoom room because if there's only one audio. Um, and so the interpreters will mute themselves while they're on this call. But um, if people are listening in another language, it'll still be simultaneous because they could log on to Zoom, mute themselves on Zoom and hear both like the English and um, their preferred language at the same time. So just, so just like a in-person meeting. Do all the interpreters have headphones? <laughs> Mandy, I don't see headphones for you. Do you have headphones? No, I don't. Okay, then you don't have the equipment needed to 
interpretation services. We, we need you to have headphones. That's one of the requirements. Did you tell the vendor that you had headphones? They didn't ask you, okay. Uh, do you have any headphones at your home at all that you can use? You need headphones that connect to your computer because we can hear what's being said in the English line because you're not using headphones. Maude, could you make Ben a co-host? Yeah, is Emily been let in? Or I, there's 227 people in the waiting room. I just so saw Emily in there as Jasper. Oh, oh here she is. Okay, yeah, if you can make both Emily and um, I'm making co-host yeah. uh, co right now. Okay. Did um, Mandy, did you go through a training on how to provide interpretation for Zoom meetings with the vendor? Mandy? Why aren't we letting people in right now? They're going to get frustrated. We're, we're not. This is just the interpreters and it's uh, so our meeting is set to start. So as soon as we let's get the interpreter thing, our meetings called for 630. So we will let them in shortly. Okay. Do you need any more additional other than the heads? Have we sorted out the last of the interpretation issue? I hope so. Does do all interpreters have headphones on? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think we're yes. still missing. One, uh, the other uh, Cantonese interpreter. Is this something that can be taken care of offline, though, because um, it's time for the CC meeting to start? Yeah. The interpreter said she's not able to join, um, so we're trying to work that out, but otherwise I think we're good to go. Okay. Okay, I'm going to admit everyone then, okay? You hold my camera. You hold my camera. Mod, can you change the settings so that um, all participants are on mute? Um, I have a teacher. Okay, we're going to just wait a few more moments as people are entering from the waiting room and then we will get busy. Get started. Then. <laughs> Okay, as we get started in about one minute, um, I'm going to need a CEC member, um, who, not Ushma, because she is doing other things, to continue to admit people from the waiting room.
Maud, could you switch the settings so that everyone just automatically joins? It's also in the bottom right hand corner. You should be able to just uncheck waiting room. Okay. How can I do that? Oh, wait, I see. Sorry. Um, part from participants. There should be an option where you can uncheck waiting room. Like put participants in waiting room. Yeah. There is enable waiting room. Is that the one? Yeah, so you would just uncheck. I, I can't see it because we're co -host. It is unchecked. It is unchecked. Okay. Uh, I'll just keep on letting people in. That's fine. I'll just. Thank you, Tom. It says one waiting, though. He's, that person's joining. Okay. So I okay. can let people in too, so I, it's showing up on my screen, so I'll let them in as well. Okay, so I'd, le I'd like to take out the waiting room if I can, but I need you guys, but I don't know how to do it, so I need you guys to keep letting people in. All right. Um, and who, who's doing this for me? Tom and Len? Yeah, admitting, yes. Okay, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Len. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Community Education Council District 2 calendar meeting for May 14th. My name is Maud Marin. I'm the president of the council and I will facilitate this evening along with my fellow council member Ushma Neal, uh, who is labeled, I, we have all written our names, correct, and CEC2, as well as the Department of Education's Family and Community Empowerment Office liaison, Michelle Chang, who should be in your upper left-hand corner. We have interpretation for this evening, uh, and we are going to uh, explain how that will work now. And I will, I will turn that over to uh, Michelle Chang. You should, we have Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese interpreters. You should see videos of these interpreters on, on your screen, and they are labeled with the language they are interpreting. Thank you to all the interpreters for being with us tonight and providing this important service to our families. Michelle Chang, our face liaison, will now explain how interpretation will work tonight. Hi, everybody. Um, so we have interpretation available in Spanish, in Mandarin, and in Cantonese. Um, our Spanish interpreters are Yaling Montiel, and, oh, I just saw the other one. Let's see. Ma, do you see the other interpreter on our screen? I believe her name is Paula. Um, but for interpreter, there we go, Paula Santiago. Um, so interpreters, if you could just rename yourself to have your language first in your name, that would be great. For Mandarin, we have Dongfang Liu and um, Yi as well. For Cantonese, we have Mandy. So if you need interpretation. Um, these interpreters will now announce in their languages the way you can um, get onto the interpretation line for each. So I'm going to unmute um, Yaling if you can explain Spanish interpretation first. Uh, good evening, everybody. The following message is going to be in Spanish, offering interpretation services. Buenas noches a todos. Gracias por estar acá. Si desean servicios de interpretación en español, por favor marque al número 978-990-5465 y, e introduzca el código de acceso 567-7080 numeral. Le repito la información. Marque desde su teléfono al número 978-990-5465 e introduzca el número de acceso 567-7080 numeral. Si desea escuchar audio en español pero desea permanecer en esta sala de conferencias virtual para poder ver la reunión desde su computadora, por favor silencie su computadora y silencie todos sus dispositivos y marque desde su teléfono. Gracias. Thank you. Um, now for the Mandarin interpretation message. 
Okay. Hi, good evening, um, everyone. This is Ying. Uh, tonight, I'm an interpreter for the Mandarin. Um, uh,下面我会做这个国语的翻译。今我是今天晚上的国语翻译。如果你们有任何问题的话，可以讲国语，我来翻译。谢谢。Thank you. Thank you. And now for the Cantonese interpretation, Mandy. Hi. Good evening. My name is Mandy Eng. I'm the Cantonese interpreter for tonight's event. Um, go go. 大家大家你好。Uh, 晚安,我是Mandy,如果你需要廣東話翻譯,你可以舉手,我們會幫你翻譯你所有問題,然後就講出來,多謝曬。All right, thank you interpreters. So because we will be having simultaneous interpretation throughout this meeting, it's very important that everyone speaks slower than usual to allow the interpreters to keep up. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to go over our housekeeping items. Mod back to you. Okay. Um, so folks, we have, um, one more logistical item to cover before we start, and that's how we're going to allow public comment tonight. Um, we have on our agenda, the fourth and eighth item on the calendar is public comment. There'll be an opportunity for you to make any statement or respectfully address a CEC member or a superintendent. When it is time for public comment, we will repeat the following instructions to make sure you have an opportunity to speak if you want. First, we will take questions and comments from participants joined via the computer in the Zoom. Uh, you will please click on the public comment Google form. You can see Ushma Neal, who is our council member, is holding up uh, a piece of paper which has the Google form link that you can click on um, that has been placed in our chat. If you go to the chat, you will see uh, Ushma has posted at 6.35 p.m. the Google Form link. You can click on that and she will write down your names. We are going to have um, most likely some elected officials join us who will speak first. Then we will have um, PTA members and SLT members as well as any member of um, the public who wishes to speak. You can give your name and uh, your child's school. And uh, we ask that you speak for one minute as we have a very full room. We have over 350 participants in the room. And so we want to give as many people possible uh, the time to speak. We will also take questions and comments from participants in the Chinese and Spanish rooms. So, um, finally, if you've called in by phone only, Michelle Chang can call out the last four digits of your phone number and you can manually unmute your line um, and be allowed to uh, make a public comment. Please state your name slowly before beginning your comment. Um, I have slightly different from last month when we had our calendar meeting. Myself, other CEC members, our superintendent and our face liaison are all panelists who can mute and unmute themselves. I've asked CEC members to rename themselves in Zoom as CEC members so you will know who they are when they speak. This is a public meeting, it is being recorded. The public comment section and the chat feature of Zoom are both important to allow us to interact with one another and hear from one another in our new virtual setting. We need to be courteous to one another. At a special meeting earlier this month, some hurtful comments were posted. We all need to do better than that. I ask every attendee and council member to use the chat respectfully. The chat provides a valuable outlet of communication and you have used it to post helpful links and share ideas that is appreciated and encouraged. That's great, keep it up. We will not be able to continue the chat feature or we'll need to moderate it and remove commentators if uh, basic rules of decorum are not respected. And I trust everyone uh, who signed on tonight um, to use their good judgment. Um, finally, I'd also like to mention that um, uh, with, at the last calendar meeting, I had mentioned we had invited the Office of Enrollment uh, and they had agreed to attend uh, this meeting. They have canceled their attendance for this meeting, unfortunately, as I know many of you have questions for enrollment, uh, but we did submit to enrollment um, a list of questions about the current 
in, uh, admissions, um, current admissions offers, as well as general admissions questions and admissions policies for next year. The, the answers, the written answers to those questions are posted on our website. They're on the first page right under our, um, uh, right under the announcement of this meeting. So you can go to cecd2.net and see the document entitled questions, uh, admissions questions for enrollment. Um, so that is available to answer those questions. Additionally, there is a meeting this Saturday from 10 to 12 by um, uh, a group called the Education Council Consortium, of which several, but not all CEC members are uh, members. Uh, I, along with some other folks, have asked the Department of Education to allow that meeting to be public as this one is, so that folks can hear what um, is being said and advocated for around the admission policy for next year. Um, to date, that meeting has not been made public. It is um, uh, limited to CEC members who were invited and who RSVP'd, but I have encouraged, along with other folks, the DOE to allow uh, public school parents to hear what is being said at, at meetings such as that, because all CEC meetings are, in fact, uh, public, and so a gathering of CEC members um, you know, can also be public in the same way. If anything changes with regard to that, we will certainly post the information on our website. Um, now, according to our um, agenda, we are going to have, a, we have six resolutions on the, on the um, agenda tonight, and we are going to have a presentation of those resolutions, unless anyone wants to adjourn any of the resolutions. I will allow the, um, uh, uh, the, um, the folks who are submitting those resolutions to, uh, to give a very brief explanation of why of those resolutions, and then we will move right into the first public session. And again, thank you all for joining us tonight. The first resolution uh, is the Info Hub resolution, and I believe Eric Goldberg is going to speak to it. All right, thank you, Maud. I'll actually take the time to introduce resolutions 135, 136, and 140. Um, you know, consecutively. Okay. So all of these um, pertain to screening. And I do think that any discussion of screening really should begin with the simple fact that we're talking about 10 year olds, our kids who are still developing, still growing into the teenagers and adults that they will become with our support and the support of our schools. There's been an ongoing discussion about how screening aligns to our values but we also need to look at the mechanics, the design and implementation of the system and ask a simple question. Does it tell us anything meaningful about a child's potential? The stakes are high. If we're gonna walk down this path of assessing, sorting and selecting 10 year olds, we must, we must ensure that the process works. We put our trust in the DOE, Superintendent Chumney, principals, that they will develop a system that fairly and equitably evaluates our children and their potential. But the truth is we've been deceived. We've been told that screening is a sophisticated nuanced process that can identify small distinctions among children. But the truth is, if you look closely, you'll find it's a deeply flawed and broken system that violates any semblance of basic design principles and willfully ignores glaring implementation issues. Sadly, our educators, administrators acknowledge these flaws. We as parents see them, and importantly, our children do as well. And yet we let it persist. This resolution, this group of resolutions, itemizes the list of design and implementation flaws that render these screens meaningless and useless, and ask the council, the DOE, and the community to put an end to it. This system asks us to believe that we can compare a child's math grade at one school to a child's math grade at another, yet it doesn't give us any information on grade distribution at these schools or grade inflation. It asks us to use state tests designed as diagnostic assessments and use them instead as selective assessments. It asks us to ignore the rampant private test prep and tutoring that go along with state tests. It goes even further and it asks us to assess a 10-year-old's potential on their attendance, 
something we know they don't control. And then it asks us to suspend disbelief and embrace school-based assessments where the tests are not shared, not reviewed, not audited for liability or validity. And then the biggest leap, it asks us to believe in interviews, 10 minute interviews with a child by interviewers with no training, no unconscious bias training, and no interview guides. And again, this is just the design flaws. There's also implementation issues as well. There's no transparency. Schools don't share rubrics. They don't share the cut scores. There's inconsistency among schools. This list is long and it is consistently ignored. So this resolution challenges the community tonight to reflect on this system. It challenges you to think if this system truly measures your child's potential, if this system treats all children fairly, and ultimately, if you want this system to be the arbiter of your child's middle school placement. The resolution asks if you want to invest in a system that the DOE doesn't seem to care about, to invest in a system that elevates competition instead of collaboration, a system that places admissions ahead of learning, and a system that ultimately segregates our children, and to what end, for what purpose. So I ask you to focus on the mechanics of this system tonight, to focus on the design, on the implementation. I look forward to hearing from fellow council members and the community. Eric. So Eric, I'm not sure what happened to Eric. I don't see his screen. Eric, that, that, is, that was your presentation for all of the resolutions? He's on mute. Oh. Okay. He can unmute. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes, so it was. Something together. So I just want to, in our in our um, introduction of um, uh, Vincent, are you here, Vincent Hom, our CEC member? I know you were let into the room. Vincent is our recording secretary. Vincent, you can unmute. Yes. Him. Yes, I'm here. Oh, I skipped the very first item on our calendar meeting agenda for May 14th, which is the call to order and the roll call. So I have called this meeting to order, but we need to have our roll call. Vincent, will you please do that? Sure. Uh, so uh, earlier I checked and all 11 members are on, but I'll just you know go through the process. Uh, Maud Marin, you're here. Uh, Eric Goldberg just spoke. Uh, Robin Broshi. Here. Okay. Uh, I see Tom Rockledge on the screen. Hi, Vincent. Uh, Ushmanil. Right here. Uh, right. Uh, Shino, Shino Tanakawa. Here. Uh, Len Silverman. Hi, Vincent. Uh, Emily Hellstrom. Yes, I'm here. Uh, Edward Irizari. Yes, I saw Edward. Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Benjamin Morden. Uh, I'm here. Good evening. Okay. And our student member, uh, Violet Becker. Violet here. I'm not sure. Uh, I did not see her when searching earlier. Okay. Um, we have. Okay. Okay. So everyone's here except Violet. Okay, um, then I will just briefly introduce the two resolutions, uh, the two additional resolutions, which are resolutions 141 and 142. Um, I, the first is one in support of allowing district specific admission policy and meaningful parent input in its development. Um, I mentioned earlier that the um, that we don't have the opportunity to allow parents to speak to enrollment tonight as we had anticipated we would. Um, there's a significant amount of difference between the numerous districts that we have in New York City. There's six alone in Manhattan. And our districts have developed admissions policies um, as a district for, for quite some time now with parent input. Um, do I think it's always perfect parent input? I do not. But we, our, our parents have been listened to sometimes through the, this spot. 
body. Um, um, and sometimes through, uh, through other feedback to tell me if you can hear me. Yeah, yes or no. Um, Maude, what you just said over the last minute or two kind of broke up. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? In and out. Yes. Okay. Um, it is a very short resolution. I'll let folks read it. Um, instead of repeating everything I said, resolution 142 um, is also talks about the history of our district and the fact that we have had we haven't had a dress for a really long time. And this resolution, which is in support of establishing a fully integrated kindergarten through 12th grade continuum of schools in our district, really in many ways was inspired by some of the admissions errors that Eric Goldberg referenced when he talked about this process. Because last year when parents were informed that the process had not worked um, gotten an incorrect KDEC at meetings that we had and expressed this enormous frustration with the process and how incredibly difficult the process was and what we have had in response um, from various schools are changes to rubrics at one school or another. These changes impact all the other schools and we don't wind up expanding the number of seats that meet the clearly articulated needs and wants and expressed uh, desires of the families in our district. I think and I propose in this resolution that we need to listen to parents when they articulate the kind of education that they're looking for for their children and the fact that the process itself should not be so brutal and hard and parents should have a guarantee that their children have somewhere to go within their district as an elementary student as a middle school student responsive to that. Of that, we can have plans that are thoughtful and that we are able to effectuate if we know we're chil that children have a space to go to school from kindergarten through 12th grade. The New York um, individual districts to develop their integration plans. And I have worked for two years with our team to develop an integration plan that is based on the way in which our district functions and the way in which our admission system has long functioned. Um, it's a smart plan and it's a good plan. We don't have a citywide plan that has been offered despite the fact that we are coming up on three years since the equity and excellence report was released by our mayor. So districts have had to develop plans and I think given the size of system in our city that uh, um, having a district I think yeah it's not working it's mod it's you've been it's your connection for a couple of seconds yeah I think her video has stopped as well yeah yeah I, I think she, she dropped um so why don't we uh, is there another to, resolution I know, um, move on? I don't know. I think um, uh, Harvey. I think we've said covered all the resolutions. Well, not the budget. There's a budget yeah. resolution as well. Shino, did you want to talk about the budget resolution? Okay. One thirty-nine. Absolutely. Yes. Um, just quickly, this is something that I think everybody in this Zoom room know. 
we as a New York City public schools are owed billion dollars, more than a billion dollars by the state. And this year we got some money, but not as much as we should have. What the governor did with the state budget, he supplanted the $1.1 billion of stimulus money by extract, subtracting that same amount from the state funding. So our funding is even from the state, even though there should be extra funding from the stimulus package. Um, and then subsequent to that, the mayor announced a series of severe cuts to our education system. Some of them will affect all our children at the classroom level because it's cutting fair student funding. So the resolution is calling on the state legislators to consider revenue generating bills that did not pass during the last session because the governor blocked them. But we need to raise more revenues at the state level. We are urging the state legislators not to further cut any education funding and also calling on the governor to do so because it is his authority to be able to cut in the middle of the fiscal year. We're also calling the New York City DOE to consider how funding is routed to central offices and administrative offices and a variety of contracts which may not be necessary during this remote learning period. So we're calling the DOE to really be critical and take a, a very sharp look at the contracts and administrative costs before cutting funding that go to our students directly. We're also asking the legislators at all levels and particularly at the congressional level to work on additional stimulus funding from the federal government. And we would like to see that funding come directly to local school districts rather than that money going through the state education department. So that is in a nutshell is the supporting um, school funding resolution is about. Thanks. And I'd just like to add on to that just a public service announcement um, that has to do with budgets. Um, obviously, we know that we need our state money, um, but we also need our federal money. And one of the um, surest ways to get that federal money is to fill out the census. Um, the, sense, the states with the greatest number of people and the highest concentrations of poverty receive proportionally greater amounts of federal aid than other states. Um, if membership in such groups is not accurately represented in the census, census, states will have a harder time meeting the needs that exist in their communities. So I put a link in for the census, um, a simple public service announcement. Um, if you've done it already, please get your neighbors to do it. If you haven't done it already, please do it. Was Maude able to rejoin? I am here and I apologize for the bad audio before. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, yep. is that better? You have to tell the kids right. to get off. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just had to move rooms. I was trying not to occupy our living room, but this is the, the world of our, our new virtual world that we all must be in. So, um, okay, so we had a presentation from all of the resolutions and now we are going to move to our first public session. And Ushma has for us that our um, assembly member Harvey Epstein is here to speak. So, welcome, assembly Hi. member. Oh, thank you, Maud. Thank you all for being here and, and, and talking about these important issues. It's, um, I know we just heard from Gino about the budget, and probably will know this weekend we will see some proposed cuts likely to come from the governor. Uh, it may not happen this weekend based on the budget numbers. We're looking between 10 and $13 billion in lost revenue, which means based on the, the, the budget we passed in April, which means that the governor could at any time cut everything by 20%. We mean cross the board cuts on our school aid, our Medicare, Medicaid, higher education. We're already seeing CUNY cuts of 25% of faculty. So this is gonna have wide scale impact on all of us. We should all really be paying attention to it. Once the governor proposes those cuts, we'll have 10 days of the legislature to come back. I've been pushing for new revenue sources. There's three different kinds of sources of revenue I'm talking about on the state level. One is a tax on high income earners. Two is what's called a mezzanine debt tax to ensure that people who invest in real estate, private equity companies pay the same as we do when we do mortgage reporting taxes. Those are critical issues and those are a really important thing to keep us going. And 
the big thing around a wealth tax. So those are three things that, are, that could happen in response to the governor's cuts. If we don't see anything but those cuts, uh, we're going to see not just losing composting and you know summer youth, we will see wholesale losses in the city that we haven't seen since the early 70s. We have a choice in our state right now, and it's for all of us to decide. Are we going to see what we did in 2930 with the Great Recession and building places like Brooklyn College in the 50s where we did tax higher income murders? Or we see the New Yorkers of the New York of the 70s, which was cuts and cuts and cuts. And I'm hopeful to, you know, as two, I have a father raising two children. My wife and I love this city. We want to fight for a stronger city, but this is going to be tough time. So it's really going to depend on all of us. That's the budget frame. I just want to make sure of what Chino was talking about. We on the people understand the context. And the admissions thing is really a big issue. I know Eric's talking about the admissions to middle school and the question will say, how can we judge any fourth grader based on uh, you know, attendance this year for next year? We can't because we don't really know what attendance is. If someone's living in a homeless shelter and didn't get a laptop for a month, what does that mean? So we're gonna have to look at admissions and I know I talked to the uh, Department of Education and I know they're reaching out to CECs. I think the more information you can share, the better. We're gonna to have to revisit this in a really thoughtful way because it's gonna impact people's teachers. Middle school, you know, fourth grade attendance. You know, we can't look at third grade attendance because that's a problem. And then we'll have to figure out what we wanna do about high school. It's really a lot to deal with for all of us. And I really applaud everyone being on this call and in their evening. I wanna applaud the healthcare heroes that we just applauded for a few minutes ago. And my office is available. If people want to reach out, they can call my office, 212-979-9696, or email me. I represent the 74th District, and I'm happy to continue to work with you all. Thank you for the few minutes. Harvey, can you post that in the chat for us? <laughs> Not everything you just said, Harvey. <laughs> but, um, Thank you very much, Assemblymember Epstein. We appreciate it. And we have Councilmember Ben Kalos, um, who will be joining us next. I want to start with a huge thank you to uh, Maud Marin and everyone on CEC2, all the great work that you do. I, I have one thing that I need to report back. I believe the CEC passed a resolution in favor of a French dual language program. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that we were able to work with Maud and many of you and a group of French people, including the French consulate. Uh, this was truly, truly an international effort. Uh, the pre-K center at East 76th Street in my district has opened up multiple sections. Offers went out for pre-K uh, this week. And a lot of, we, got, we heard from a lot, we, we, we got a, a lot of thank yous in French. So I wanna thank you for your partnership on getting that done. I think we got it done in less than a year and now we need to start looking for a school in District 2 that is willing to take on at least one section, if not two sections for French dual language. Uh, so I, I hope we can work together and identify a principal who will be welcoming. We have amazing support from the CEC, and I think we have an absolutely amazing superintendent in Donalda Chumney. I also wanted to uh, flag that uh, the specialized high schools issue uh, happened a little bit this time during the pandemic, but there's still no real solutions being offered. I've authored introduction 1924 with public advocate Jamani Williams. He went to Brooklyn Tech. I went to Bronx Science. Uh, when we went to those schools, the schools were completely different. Uh, I think that when, when Jamani went to Brooklyn Tech, it was 38% uh, black, and now it's 7% black. When I went to Bronx High School of Science, it went from being 10% uh, Hispanic, 12% Black, down to 9% for both, so more than halved. So uh, something's wrong. And so the bill is asking the city to do two things. Uh, the first is to make sure everyone has access to test prep. And uh, we've been partnering with the uh, Equity and Excellence Group uh, the education equity campaign, and they found that if we do specific types of interventions, that it actually helps, and they had a higher than average admissions rate. And the other piece is, what if we just let every single kid take the test, and just, it, it's default, the kids get the test, and they have to opt out, and they can opt out, uh, and then we ask them questions when they're sitting for the exam. I know a lot of people say, oh, it's test prep, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. 
but we can just ask the kids that as a questionnaire before they take the test. So that's what the legislation would do. It's a uh, introduction uh, 1924. I'd love for the CEC to consider a resolution uh, in support or if there's improvements, we will take them. Another key piece is as we talk about the budget, I wanna thank Harvey Epstein for his leadership in Albany. I'm really concerned about huge, huge wastes of money. Um, and I'm not talking about like a million dollars here and there. I'm talking about a quarter billion dollars on 300,000 iPads at $740 each. Just so you know, you can go online and order an app, Apple iPad for about $400. Uh, so the city almost paid twice as much because we were buying it in a crisis. Uh, my understanding is the city gave about 200,000 out to students and 80,000 out to, I believe, private schools and charter schools uh, because they ran out of people to give it to. And as of the last budget hearing this week, the chancellor still has 20,000 iPads they haven't given out. And as far as I'm concerned, I'd like them to return it and get back $15 million, which could help pay for SYP. They're also trying to cut after school programs. People still work nine to five. so. Um, I think there are huge places as contracts chair. I've been looking uh, con uh, Education chair uh, Traeger and I are looking at can we start can can canceling some of the consulting contracts. We're also paying people not to do anything. So uh, We have a 16 billion dollar contracts budget. We can cut that before we start cutting school programs. And I think the, the last piece I just wanted to touch base on um, and really why I'm here is I've been hearing a lot from parents. Uh, and, and I'm a parent too. I've got a two-year-old. You may have overheard her on her way to bed, but I've been hearing from a lot of parents and they've been very concerned with uh, the remote learning, trying to keep their kids motivated. And I, I've heard from folks who said, listen, my, my student, it was hard to keep them motivated, but ever since the, the policies were changed, I, I can't get them to do homework anymore. And we're also nervous about how the admissions process is going to work. So I just wanted to come out and say I, I support your resolution and I think that whatever we do going forward, we need to include the CECs and parents in the decision making. And if you have any guidance, we are open to working with you and understanding from you and whatever I can do in the city council to support you to make sure that you have a voice in your children's future and that you have the support you need because what I've heard from parents is that not only are you doing your full-time jobs, not only are you full-time parenting, which I know is a challenge myself, but now you're also trying to full-time teach on top of everything in partnership with our teachers. So I just wanted to come share my support and uh, continue to partner with you. So thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Council Member Kalos. And uh, yes, I wanna underline that it's really wonderful to get the French uh, universal pre-K program going and definitely we will start thinking to next year in terms of expanding uh, dual language programs in District 2. Uh, that's something I've, I've wanted to see for a long time and I know lots and lots of parents do as well. Um, okay, thank you very much. I will try to look for Ushma so that we can see. I don't see Ushma on the top of my screen so that we can see who is our next speaker. Um, where are you? So the, the next speakers are Lilibeth Feliciano, Elka, Samuel Smith, Kaushik Das, William Doyle, and Michelle. Wonderful. So, so Lilibeth Feliciano. Lilibeth, you will be unmuted. Lilibeth, you're unmuted. Lilibeth, are you still there? Um, if you just uh, can, I just go in the next turn. I'm trying to get my kids out of the room so I can actually speak. Sure. <laughs> Thank sure. you. In that case, we'll move on to Elka Samuel Smith. I'm sorry. Can you push me down to the bottom of the or um, let somebody else go before me? I'm handling something at the moment. Of course. Yes. All right. So next up, we have Kaushik Das. My name is Kojik Das. I'm a SLT chair at PS33. I'm also a member of PLACE. Um, I, but my comments are my own. Uh, speaking to a CEC member who said that screen schools are flawed, is there room for improvement? Absolutely. 
what I, I would be personally be happy to see increased transparency and additional data like Gates grade distribution. Perhaps it could be added to admissions rubrics. But those who promote equity, excellence, and opportunity that propone that propose a dismantling of the entire screen system, not only do I disagree outright, I outright question the wisdom of doing this during a year where we're expecting massive budget cuts. Someone spoke to the mechanics of this. Have, has anyone thought about the fact that our screen schools in our district operationally prepared to accept a larger influx of students who might be a year be, behind in reading? Or are zoning community schools prepared to offer challenging curriculum to students from a G&T track that might be one or several years ahead in math? This is a reality in our district. <clears throat> Aside from that, I agree with Maud's proposal that families should be listened to, especially parents who have offered significant amounts of their time in, by the PTA, SLT, and CEC. Additionally, principals and teachers should be, should be listened to, many of whom found out about grading policy at the same time that anyone else, everyone else is in the news. So I absolutely suppose Maud's proposal. All right, next we have William Doyle. Hi. I'm parent of a District 2 middle schooler who attends the regular program at our partially screened neighborhood school. My child deserves nothing more and nothing less than any other city child in terms of educational resources, access to accelerated instruction, and the right to attend a desegregated school as an American citizen. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that public education is, quote, a right which must be made available to all on equal terms, unquote. This city has violated that ruling every day for the last 66 years through today. We're cursed with the most segregated school system in the nation. This is one New York City parent who believes that our schools should be integrated, discriminatory screens should be abolished, and every child should be given the right of public education on equal terms, including access to accelerated instruction in their own school. Let's make all our schools good to fairly serve every child. Thank you. Next, we have Michelle. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, so I have twin seventh graders and I do think that everyone should have access to a wonderful education, but to make so many changes when there's so many changes going on right now, my kids are so stressed out and anxious. They've been studying so hard this year to get into a good high school and now they are dispirited and anxious because they have no idea what's going on with this high school application process. Um, I, I think to cause more chaos and unknown by taking away the process that's in place right now is so unfair to these students when they've worked so hard and they know that this is the year that counts more than anything. They've been striving to try to get accepted into the best schools that match their ac uh, academic performance. And I think kids should be matched and challenged in programs that challenge them. Every school should be challenging and every school should be made stronger. We should also focus on making every school good. And especially in light of COVID, kids shouldn't have to travel so far. Having our kids on the subway is something that makes me nervous. If we had good schools and our kids could stay in our district, kids wouldn't have to travel so far and put our kids on public transportation. Every school in every district should be good but I would prefer if my kids could stay in the district and that's you know, what we would really want. So I am definitely in favor of leaving the screens the way they are right now because our kids are so anxious and dispirited right now with everything going on to, to make more changes right now is so unfair to them. All right, we're gonna come back to Lilibeth. Lilibeth, um, I'm unmuting you. Let me know if you'd like to go right now. Okay, I think we're gonna come back to her later. Um, moving on to Elka. Yeah, let's come back to Elka as well. So next we have Toby um, Paper now. Hi, um, I'm Toby Perno. I'm from Teens Take Charge and also a junior at the Beacon School. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Um, so when I was in elementary school under the old District 15 middle school screening system, the whole process was so damaging to my mental health. Um, the whole process had interviews and tests and it was so embarrassing. I didn't get into my top three choices, which were all primarily white institutions that almost every single other school, every single other student in my predominantly white elementary school got into. 
but I got into Park Slope Collegiate, which is one of the most diverse middle schools in the whole city. But I lied to my friends. I didn't tell any of my friends where I got in because I was so ashamed of where I got into. Um, looking back on it though, the best lessons I've learned throughout my whole career have not been from heavily white, heavily resourced schools like Beacon, but came from the diverse Park Slope Collegiate. Uh, no elementary schools, schoolers or middle schoolers should have to go through this process made exponentially more stressful from COVID, especially when diverse integrated schools can provide the best education for all students. 17% of all students cannot even participate in remote learning yet. Screens, screening students during this global pandemic is absurd. Um, I also think that y'all are talking about listening to parents' voices so much yet have not really mentioned student voices once. We're the ones that are going through this remote learning and I've gone through the application process, so I think you all should listen to us a lot more and less from these white parents of white students who have more, <laughs> who have um, all these resources that allow their kids to get into the beacons like mine. My privilege allowed me to get into my school. I thought we were keeping it to one minute, just to clarify the rules. Yes, it is one minute. Hey, I think we should, I mean, I think before we began this, um, we didn't kind of go over all the ground rules, but I do hope that we give everyone an opportunity to speak up to their two minutes. I mean, everyone's joined this call tonight, and I hope we want to hear from the community. I think that's been the common theme thus far this evening is our interest in hearing the voices of parents, students, and families. So I hopefully we can respect everyone's voice. Agreed, Eric, but uh, there's agree. going to be a lot of people speaking. Hey, Tom and Eric, listen, we're going to uh, keep it. Yes, we are suggesting one minute. We discussed that in advance at our work and business meeting to have shorter than two minutes to go to one minute because we have so many people. I see 367 participants in this meeting. I'm thrilled that people want to be heard and speak up. I certainly was not going to cut off this young man as he was speaking. I think it's great to hear student voices. We are going to move forward respectfully, ask people to keep their comments to one minute, and let folks... Um, try to exercise a little self-restraint in their comments. Can we move on to our next speaker, which is Nina? Hi, I support the resolutions that have been put forward that stop the screening of 10 year olds. I believe in a community public school system that models a simple, straightforward admissions process, a registration to public school that is consistent with the founding principles of our country, like the Declaration of Independence, often referred to. Um, if it, it was a simple public school process, then there would truly be equal access for every 10-year-old to every middle school. So to me, the DOE's current system doesn't abide by our founding principles. It also doesn't abide by the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Ed decision, and this is decades and decades later, and I know there's always concerns about change, but what are we modeling? As we are worried about change and the repercussions, we're modeling a very corrosive message to our students, which is that it's good, if not best, to resist and go around or outside the law. I firmly disagree with that lesson that we're teaching our kids every day. Thank you. They see it. Jane. Jane Burke. Oh, hi, I'm sorry, let me unmute myself. Oh, good. Um, I wanted to add a few things that um, address kids going in to universal pre-K, uh, kindergarten. Um, I know that we're in very, very tough times. There are a lot of issues that are up for consideration now. Um, this system has often been fraught with chaos. This year, it has just been beyond the pale. Um, children, parents, families have been waitlisted. Um, in schools that they didn't even rank um, out of districts. Kids um, have put down schools. 
that um, they are siblings in, um, they are priority, um, their prior eligibility is priority, and they're double digit waitlisted. Um, I, I, the chaos and lack of organization at the DOE has been uh, worse this year than I can ever remember it being. And in addition to that, um, the responses to gifted and talented tests, which have already occurred, um, there were people who, 20% at least of families whose children took the test did not hear. They received, uh, they were not able to get on portals. They received blank information on portals and had no way of getting a response for at least three weeks. And um, it's just a, a broken system as well. So I wanted to I wanted to put that out there. Um, if we're treating, thank you, Jane. Thank um, you, Jane, so much. Please come on. Michelle, can you announce our next speaker? Mm -hmm. Yes, Alexa, Sophia, you are unmuted. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Alexa Sophia, and I am a junior at the New York City Lab School. Um, I'm also a member of Teens Take Charge. When I was 13 years old, I moved to, New to the New York City public school system from Miami. I was in that school system for about 10 years and it was, was one of the most amazing experiences I ever had because my school was so incredibly diverse and we learned so many things from each other because we had different perspectives, different language backgrounds. And then I came here, I, I got into Eastside Middle School and the first thing I realized when I walked into my class was how white it was, to be honest. And I, I really did not understand why until I joined Teens Take Charge. And so New York City is the nation's most segregated school system. This is partly because it has the most competitive admission screening in the country. Zip codes, grades, test scores, and attendance are measures of a student's access to resources and level of income not potential. There are multiple reasons why in the area of the coronavirus that the use of admission screens would be unethical. Would the DOE consider eliminating all exclusionary public school admission screens in recognition of the inequities exposed by COVID-19? And that's addressed to anyone who can answer. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Rachel Okay, can you, my name is Rachel Gluby. I have a ninth grader and a sixth grader. My kids have been in G&T, gen, gen Ed, and Special Ed. I'm concerned about the social and emotional impact of the labeling, sorting, and isolating of 10-year-olds based on test scores and grades. We are not talking about college students applying to law school. We are talking about children who now more than ever, I think we all could agree, need to socialize, to play with each other, to learn to manage the schoolyard during recess, to pursue sports and other off-screen hobbies, to take care of their changing bodies and health, and yes, also academics. It may sound controversial and scary to remove screens. Hey, it would certainly help save some parents some money on tutors. It would certainly reduce stress among parents and students not having to deal with the application process. I'm guessing it would also save some DOE some cash too because they don't have to administer all of these things and those people who work for the DOE could be doing other, serve other functions. At the February CEC meetings, there were parents who cheered and we all agreed to improving racial equity in the district, cheered applauded and now we have resolutions to address this issue and it's 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 being criticized i want to point out that in the past when this district when the cec has been has received a grant by the state to consider mechanisms for improving racial diversity in our district our cec chose to pilot a program fo focused on admission policies in five chinatown maybe not five a certain number of chinatown elementary schools i don't know the result of that pilot but i don't see how that relates to integration and so i'm i just not fully trustful of um, some of the proposals that are being um, made today. 
Removing screens has been an idea that has been discussed for years and implemented in other districts, wealthy ones, like the Upper West Side and Park Slope. Rachel, you've gone so over we, the time at it, this point. We are going to move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Again, Mar, I just want to point out that I think parents and families have come tonight to share their thoughts with us and i think that we should listen and at least give people that flexibility the two minute time limit is the typical two minute time limit for the cec hey, Rachel, she went over two minutes Eric, Eric, and she went over two minutes wrong. you asked for two minutes and we gave her two minutes we're suggesting one minute for everybody and she went over two minutes eric so at this point we're going to move on i've cut off other parents we're going to move on our next speaker and i object to cutting off parents oh. I That's heard correct. the objection every time. What if someone speaks for seven minutes, Eric? We're going to have to cut you off in a minute. If parents have to abide by time constraints when they, we have over 350 people in a meeting. Go to the next speaker, please. So um, I, I'll be two seconds. My apologies. My kids weren't cooperating. I am. I have twin girls in PS51, Elias Howell. And I know uh, there's a lot of proposals and there's a lot of juggling balls. The only thing I kind of want to put out there, and, and I know it's not going to be fixed today, but there are so many other things that we could focus our efforts on during this COVID epidemic. And I know that we have to address this, but the thought of having to navigate through admissions and criteria and having to figure out where each twin is going to go if one scores higher than the other, and if one has to go to the other side of the city and the other one has to go to the other side of the city, as a parent dealing directly with COVID, I've lost three family members now, now I'm on my third. My husband is recovering, I have 15 family members. And the thought of having to navigate through that seems just not equitable in any sense of the word. So to me, it's not a matter of what's right, what's wrong. It's what's right mentally for all our parents, for our kids during this time. And it's just to stop, it's just to put a pause. If our lives are on pause, if our livelihoods are on pause, our healths are on pause, our socialization is on pause. Why is it such a big deal to put this on pause for our kids? That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Rita Dokovic, are you there? You are unmuted. All right, hi, uh, hi, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I have. Um, um, uh, he's uh, in eighth grade right now, um, and yes, the same. This this process I've uh, been with through with my son that he is now in eleventh grade. It's unfair all this uh, process that you have to go through, and then your child is placed at the school that wasn't even in his application. Um, the computer chose a school for him, and now he's on the wait list for all the other twelve schools. Uh, and the numbers on the wait list is so high that I don't even know if there is a chance that my son will get into any of those schools. Um, I wish I can get answers what happens if I do not want to send my son to the school. It's not because of that, but the, according to his academics, that he was an honor student for all this, um, for his seventh grade and placed in a school that their academic score is so bad that it's, my son was crying and disappointed and he says I did so well and I worked so hard and I didn't get into any of the schools any of the 12 schools that he chose so it's very um very disappointing and with this um, what's happening right now with the you know with the virus and you can get in touch with anybody um so there is, you know, I emailed um, the Department of Education, emailed the Family Center, and I haven't received any answers back. Uh, the only things they said, they have be patient and uh, see what happens with the wait list. Thank you, Rita. Karma Kelsey. Karma, you're unmuted. Michelle, I'm gonna. I know Ushma has the um, um, Ushma has the list up. I'm gonna mm -hmm. ask you to read the next three names that are gonna speak. Oh, so sure. That people can okay. Hear All right. Them so it seems like yeah. So that so, people can dare to unmute themselves. Okay. 
So karma seems to not be with us right now. So moving on to Oliver Christ and then Maya Brewster, Durain, and then Chen Kwok. Oliver, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Okay. We can uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Oliver Chris, and I'm the father of two fourth graders at PSIS 217. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. My comments are regarding the screening moratorium, Resolution Draft 140. This is only my second CEC meeting, and perhaps I don't fully understand the purpose of resolutions yet, but this one puzzles me because it is a position statement that the long list of grievances yet completely void of any suggestions regarding improving the admissions process. I think that simply calling for a moratorium without proposing how to handle admissions during that time is simply not constructive. And I'm actually dismayed that certain groups continue to ask for the elimination of existing educational structures, but again, without providing alternatives. Yes, the current process is flawed, and we should certainly reflect upon it. We should change it and improve upon it, but simply calling for its elimination is a non-starter, and I believe the resolution should be rejected. With that, thank you for your time and listening to my input. Maya Brewster. Hold on, bye. Uh, oh, I'm unmuted? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I turned my video off because it Wi-Fi. Yeah, hey, uh, you're unmuted. I'm just curious. I know. Am I unmuted? You can hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I guess my question is, I know we're living for the right now and what we're doing now in admissions, but I'm curious and a lot of parents and teachers are parents, parents and children are asking, what are we doing in September? What does September look like for physically opening our schools? Like, have we thought outside of the next four to six weeks and through the summer, is that a possibility? And if so, is that something that's top on the list of solutions. Did that come through? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank you, Maya. We heard you. Maya, I'm going to suggest that we're, we're going to, we are going to have a, um, a, a little bit more time now, maybe 15 more minutes on, on our first public session. We're then going to go to our superintendent and all the chumney who will give um, the superintendent's report. And Maya, I think she will um, address some of the questions you just raised because those are certainly good and relevant questions. All right, so our next few speakers are Chen Kwok, Samuel Chaudhary, um, Kenna Clark, and Rebecca Gruber. Chen, you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, hi. I'm a parent of uh, two public school children, a PTA co-president at PS111 and a member of PLACE NYC. My comments are my own. Uh, access to academically matched programs. Uh, we need to provide academically matched programs to all students in all schools. It's not uh, fair for any student if they are in one mixed class where there is a four-year grade level proficiency difference as there are too many schools with that difference. Currently, the debate is whether there should be screen programs. It's a terrible name to name any kind of program. And the context around the discussion is that of access. It should be about giving every child with an opportunity and the support to learn to meet their full potential. This opportunity and support should be in every school. I also want to talk about education mindset. Uh, the, you know, we underlying, you know, a lot of this discussion from the chancellor um, about uh, removing screens, removing GNT is a mindset that's against uh, discourages learning and effort. And it's resulted in huge achievement gaps that's now being worsened by COVID-19. Instead, we need to adopt a growth mindset that recognizes that all students have the ability to achieve in academically and ensure that actual learning takes place. Sometimes we forget about that. Um, it, and not covering up the failures to do that and lying to students and parents and giving all children access to high quality education, right? We need to provide support and challenging education matched to needs and abilities and encourage and recognize individual effort and perseverance only with policies based on this kind of mindset and leadership that will adopt this mindset will we be able to improve the, live, the lives and the outcomes of our most vulnerable children. Thank you. Samuel Chowdhury, you're unmuted, and then we'll have Kenna Clark next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, I, my question is regarding budgeting. Um, I have a child in a special education, and I am concerned since I've, you know, I've been listening in, I want to make sure that special education services are not touched. Um, there has been regression reported by many of my other parents who I speak to when with this uh, lockdown. Um, I personally could say my son has regressive PT. His, you know, he's, he has some muscle weakening now uh, because he was getting PT. So we're doing our best at home, but we definitely need um, the you know, therapies not to be touched. And if I implore everyone here, every advocate, every person who is part of the DOE to please, um, every time you talk about planning, just think about children who have special needs because they are usually an afterthought in planning. I find that from the two, three years I've been dealing with this. So if that's my only, um, you know, plea to everyone here, if whoever is in charge of planning, just to think about the kids who have special needs. Thank you. All right, up next we have Kenna Clark and then it's Rebecca Gruber and Cameron Leo and Lori B. Hi there, my name is Kenna Clark. Um, I have a fifth grader and a seventh grader in District 2 schools and I'm an arts enrichment teacher in a District 2 school. I support the resolution for a moratorium on enrollment screening because screens perpetuate segregation. This pandemic has laid bare the inequalities in our country and our school system, and we need to act swiftly to make changes. Integrate NYC has laid out the five R's of real integration, a comprehensive and intentional plan to support all students and create schools where students learn from and about kids of all different backgrounds. When we educate in integrated spaces to create empathic, brilliant, compassionate, listening types of citizens, perhaps we can look forward to a country that doesn't shoot and kill people of color like Breonna Taylor as she slept in her own home or Ahmaud Aubrey as he went for a run. And perhaps we won't have to watch a disproportionate amount of people of color die from an out of control virus. The fact that we are working towards anything other than integration at this point is tragic. Rebecca Gruber, you are next. Rebecca? Yes. Hi, I'm the parent of both an eighth grader. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Oh, let me unmute you again. Oh, I don't think we can hear you right now. Give me one second. I think you have to accept the unmute on your screen. Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm the parent of a fifth grader and a, an eighth grader in District 2, and I'd like to address the high school admissions process. Um, I'd really like to address the lack of transparency that is taking place with the current high school admissions process. The wait lists are either not moving or moving backwards, not forwards. And when they do move, they're making giant leaps backwards in one day across several schools. This cannot be coincidental, but the result of manipulation of the lists on the back end. Obviously, computers are not controlling the wait lists as we've been told. So we want to know who really is controlling them. School guidance counselors have no information or insight because the entire program was implemented once the application process had already begun. With no appeal process and a flawed waitlist system, parents have no means to discuss their child's situation and are left to flounder. The new, the new system is flawed. Superintendent Chumley, I hear you're on the call and are speaking soon. We've reached out to you directly and we hope to hear from you directly regarding our son's situation because there is no one else we can talk to. Cameron Leo, you're next. Cameron, are you there? Cameron Leo, you're up. Cameron Leo. People just stop saying. There's no cure for the cold. Okay. I think he doesn't realize he's been unmuted, so we'll move on to Lori B. Lori, you're unmuted. Yes, hi. I'm curious to find out what the plans are for this, for, um, for middle school tours. I mean, high school tours. Is it going to be a virtual tour or like, what are the plans for that? I just feel like in September, I don't know how far we are going to be um, 
along with the pandemic and just curious what uh, the plans are for touring high schools. All right, next we have Emmy Cooper, Pamela Chong. What, I'm making a comment, but they don't answer me. Did they hear you? They heard me and they said, okay, moving on. And no one even addressed my question. Okay, Lori, I'm, I'm sorry, you're still on. So all questions I think will be addressed by council members or um, you know, by the superintendent later if it's related to them. Just This is a public comment session, so it's comments only. That's why your question is not being answered. All right, on to Emmy Cooper. Emmy, are you there? All right, we are going to move on to Pamela Chung, and then we will have Edu Academy Consulting and Josh Levine. Hi, um, I guess my question is that uh, right now we're talking a lot about um, like the screen schools, but I've only been to the CEC meetings a, a, a few times, and just from my experience from last month, it seems like our like whomever whatever resolution was passed during the meeting was not even considered by um Carranza or de Blasio ultimately when they make the decision for grading changes for this year so I'm just wondering what is the oversight um of the decision making process over at the DOE and what exactly can we as parents really do in terms of influencing any decision that's made from the seems like top down? All right, next we have Edu Academy Consulting. Edu Academy Consulting. Um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Paula, and I have um, an actual child in District 2 um, in Salk School. And um, I also have my own organization, which is Consulting and Research and Education. I have mentioned before that I have come about um, learning and understanding a lot of the parents' needs um, throughout the school year and also in the past. A lot of parents are actually very overwhelmed about certain, certain changes and things that are occurring in the past and now presently with the school system. One, because they don't understand how the system works and also uh, because the new changes that have been occurring is basically not allowing them to be able to understand how to go about, as the parent had said before, the motivation, um, the stress that the children are going through is one that we need to be very focused on because we can lose a lot of children's motivation and engagement into the activities that are being sent by the school system to help them um, succeed for their school year. So um, I just bring out to the point that I've created a program called Parents Educate because at this point, well, at this moment, the most important component of the child's education are the parents. And we need to support every single parent. And I welcome all of you um, to be able to, to take part of this and to understand how much knowledge you have and all of that strength that you have that you can bring to your children. Because at this moment, this is a very critical situation. We're coming into an educational crisis. And if we don't really focus on what we need to do for our children, there's gonna be a lot of things that can be happening in the future that we're not gonna be able to come back to. Um, so I thank you for having this platform and I also welcome you to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Josh Levine, you're unmuted, and then Alexandra Hobbs and Morris Setzler. Hi, just Josh? real quick, regarding the high school admissions process, you, you can hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay, uh, now is not the time to make wholesale changes. I understand everybody's points, but it seems crazy to me to think that the answer to the uncertainty of the times is to remove grades and any other objective measures that we have to create a citywide lottery 
that ignores the individual needs of each child and can end up sending kids on a 90 minute commuting odyssey. No matter who your child is and what kind of student she is, how do you even begin to plan for the future when we're rewriting and revoking the rule book at the 11th hour? And everybody, grades are more than just test scores. Teachers have spent countless hours grading tests and papers, encouraging participation, and working closely with these students, all in an effort to paint as accurate a picture as possible through grading. To ignore that hard work is to disregard the efforts the teachers have made in support of our children. And how do you help identify those students who struggle when a C minus is the same as an A plus? And how do you challenge those who excel when there's no longer an incentive to do so? I have a child at Stuyvesant and a child at 75 Morden, and they need very different things from a high school. Screening should help ensure that each is in the best place for them as individuals. So while we don't have state test scores this year, we do have six and a half months of objective and subjective student data in the form of existing grades. I'm not sure why we're throwing more uncertainty into this process by disregarding all of that and disregarding proximity. Okay. All right, next we have um, Alexandra Hobbs. I'm gonna, I only see an Elijah Hobbs. So Elijah Hobbs, I'm gonna unmute you and I hope that's Alexandra. Hello? Alexandra, are you there? Okay, for now, we're going to move on to Mara Seltzer. Mara, you're unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I fully agree with Joshua Levine, and I wonder how the folks on this you know, call um, reconcile the fact that we are not motivating students to learn if they feel that all the work that they have done all year long is really for nothing. I mean, we all know as parents that it has helped them in terms of growing their intelligence on different subjects, but to wipe out two thirds of the year that were spent in the classroom pre-coronavirus and wipe out the first two marking periods plus the attendance that was calculated to be used in a high school admissions process doesn't make any sense at all. My daughter has a very, very high, high average that she's been working towards because she knows how important this year is and her grades previously were the same. And now she's asking me, what motivation do I have to continue to strive and get the top grades if it doesn't matter? And this is gonna be a lottery system and I could be sent to a school, potentially in another borough with a two hour commute that may be not even a good quality school. We all want all of the schools to improve everywhere in New York City but it's not going to happen by next year. And by just putting all of these kids into a lottery situation is not gonna help those that wanna thrive academically to do their best. And I, I believe that this needs to be reconsidered and it needs to be brought beyond de Blasio and Carranza if, if they're stuck to their decision and maybe take this to Cuomo or whomever else in the administration can help us. Thank you. All right, so next we have George and then Elka and Karma. So George, you are unmuted. Or I think you might have to accept the unmute on your phone. Let's try that again. No, great, thank you. So uh, George Potch was here, um, uh, father of uh, two students at Wagner uh, Middle School, great school, um, and one of them, um, will be entering a uh, specialized high school next year. I, I always intended a specialized high school, great experience and just simple comments uh, regarding the moratorium on screening, which uh, I'm against. Um, reality is that we live in a competitive world, but we also need the equal opportunity to compete. So in the need to compete and to compete equally, I support offering resources to those in need, mentoring, uh, free um, tutoring, um, uh, those with less should, should get more, and we should try our, our best to, to provide that. But instead of fighting against screening, we should look at the immediate problems. What, what are the immediate problems? I'm looking at now what um, the, um, the proficiency rate in math and English of minorities. It's, um, it's appalling. I mean, th this should be our main focus. Instead of having children fo uh, focus on being too wide at Beacon or too wide at other schools or, you know, not minorities, What's the core? The core is the proficiency in math and English of Hispanics is 33.2%. Of African Americans is 28.2%. This is unacceptable. This has to be fixed yesterday. 
this has to be addressed by the, uh, the chancellor, has to be addressed by the mayor, and I don't hear a discussion on it. We have to help people be proficient, learn the A, B, and Cs, the one, two, threes, and then we discuss more complicated issues. Thank you. Right. Elka, I'm trying to unmute you. If you can accept on your end. And then the next speakers that are all that have signed up online who we skipped are Karma Selsi, Cameron Leo, Emmy Cooper, and Alexandra, who you signed up um, as Alexandra Hobbs from PS340. Please, can you identify yourself to either Michelle or I so that we know to unmute you? And after those speakers that we're going back to, we're going to go to our superintendent's report, okay? Okay. Good? Okay. Hi. My, oh, wait, let me, un. sorry. Zion. Zion. We can hear you, Elka. So my name is Elka Samuel Smith um, from PS51, co-president, SLT member at Environmental Studies, um, and I have students in elementary and high school levels. My comments are my own. I want to start by saying that while these have been horrific times for humanity, the effects of this pandemic on nature have been quite the opposite. Simply the air quality, the water quality, just by reducing the amount of people, one thing has changed, made a drastic change that has affected nature, it's affected the growth of trees, and years of damage to the environment have been undone. Why does this relate to what I'm talking about? Well. Um, I understand that we cannot undo years of systematic racism and inequality simply by removing all screens and specialized admission procedures, but it would be a step in the right direction. I do believe that Resolution 140 outlines the issues that have been enabled, that have been enabling ongoing inequities for almost a century. I do believe that all students have the right to a high quality public school education. And I understand that it's easier to want to maintain the status quo. I think it's scary to a lot of parents to think about what will happen and how their, their students' perception of their grades might change. But I think we've been given an opportunity to seriously consider what it would mean to give every student fair and equitable access to quality education in every single one of these schools. This has been an extremely stressful situation for everybody. Um, but the current admission screening process just perpetuates unnecessary stress, anxiety, and allows for our system to continue to judge our kids at a time when they are working hard to get through these times and, and hopefully value education for the sake of education. Thank you. Right, next, we have Karma Selsi. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so my name is Karma and I'm a senior at NYC Lab High School in District 2. Um, yes, I'm aware that my school is screened, but that does not mean that I'm enjoying my experience as some have implied in the chat. My school is 56% white and 4% black, and I am part of this very small percentage of black students. Um, at my high school, I've experienced more racism than I ever have in my entire non-academic life and academic life because of the ways in which screening perpetuates segregation. And academically speaking, I fall into the category of the quote-unquote successful children um, that those who oppose screens keep mentioning. And I can say for a fact that my academic career is no more valuable than anyone else's. Um, and um, I just... I think that the, the idea that screens help sort more deserving kids into better schools implies that there are no outside factors such as racial and socioeconomic status that affect anyone's academic experience and their access to resources and their access to, to a quality education and that these children that are attending more selective schools like mine and like specialized high schools, et cetera, are inherently better or inherently more deserving. But who are any of us to say that any one child is automatically more deserving of a better or more quality education than another, especially with the knowledge that Black and Latinx students disproportionately attend these under-resourced, underfunded, and less cared for schools? Oh, she just stopped talking. We have Cameron Leo next. Okay. 
Cameron, are you there? Yes, one second, sorry. I was in the middle of dinner. Um, yeah, so I, I wanna echo everything that Karma said. Um, I go to Bronx Science and yes, that is a screen school and my privilege did buy me admission into that school and I acknowledge that. And I think that there's power in acknowledging your privilege, which is something I think that we can all learn from. Um, but we talk about students being stressed out about schools becoming unscreened, but what about the thousands of students who are stressed because in the midst of a financial crisis, they cannot afford the test prep that is needed to succeed in screening exams? And what about the thousands of students who are stressed because they have family obligations or a stressful home situation in quarantine and cannot put 100% into their grades and attendance? These are the students that you're ignoring when you defend the use of screens and the, and the students that are not represented in the conversations that you guys are having. So I just want to. Okay. Can you hear Next me? we have Emmy Cooper. Yes. Okay. Um, I just have to say that the only purpose of screens is to exclude marginalized communities from good schools. The fact that District 2 schools give priority to students that come from that district is direct evidence of this. I'm from Bed-Stuy and I worked incredibly hard to get into a District 2 middle school just so I could get to get into a, a District 2 high school. Um, and then I had to leave that school after sophomore year because I couldn't cope with race relations in a predominantly white school. Um, the curriculum there was not meant for people like me. I was given worse grades than my white peers for reasons that had nothing to do with my academic performance. There were things like lateness and absences, which is another um, part of screens that doesn't make sense. Um, I was seen as a problem there. And frankly, our school system, um, as it is communicates to black students like me that we are not good enough, that we are not smart enough, that we don't deserve quality education if we don't live in wealthy neighborhoods. And I am tired of hearing excuses. I want screens eliminated if this is going to change. Right, next we have Alexandra Hobbs. Yes, can you guys hear us? Can yes. you hear us? All right, perfect. Go ahead, Alex, ask your question. Okay, hi, um, I'm a peer mentor counselor. Um, my name is Mental Health. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about um, if there would be the department that would consider um, flexibility concerning um, remote learning for people like me. I'm also blind, and so technology is, I, I can literally tell you, um, I don't know if you can tell by the sound of my voice, but I've had like 10 heart attacks trying to access this Zoom thing. And it's a regular thing, and, and um, it's sort of, I feel like it takes away from, you know, the whole learning and homeschooling per se experience with my daughters, because I feel like a failure every time I can't connect um, my daughters to her friends or her, you know, her teachers. And I just, I, I really wonder if this, this you know, if, if, you know, are we bad parents because we're not great technology? Um, experts or if we're just, you know, if this, this is just one size fit all kind of thing. Great. Our last speaker, Kylan, you are unmuted. New York City has one of the most, is one of the most diverse cities in the country. Yet we have the most segregated public school system. Children of color have less access to quality education starting from the very beginning in kindergarten. This perpetrates systemic inequalities at every level. These systemic inequalities are seen through COVID, which disproportionately affects low-income New York communities of color. Screens based off grades, attendance, test scores, and attendance and zip code show privilege more than academic ability or drive. It is unconscionable and unethical to screen using them. Acknowledging your privilege doesn't diminish hard work. Rather, it is a statement that your race, socioeconomic standing, zip and zip code didn't make getting a quality education any harder. All right, that is the end of our um, speakers list for the first public session. Just, did more people sign up? I'm just curious for the first list. That's it? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are one. I wanted to um, acknowledge our student member, Violet Becker, um, who did join us. She actually joined us a while ago. Um, 
and so I wanted to amend our uh, our roll call to include Violet. And I don't know if I um, if I can find her to say hello to her. Uh, and we are going to, I believe, we have both our superintendent. Uh, Donalda Chumney, as well as our executive superintendent, Marisol Rosales, here with us uh, this evening. So I don't know if, Michelle, you can find Marisol Rosales. And I don't see her on here. Okay, so we'll start with Donalda Chumney, our superintendent. Donalda, you should be able to unmute yourself. I'm unmuted, thank you so much. I was just looking for my notes. Um, thanks, thanks so much for having me tonight. And first, I would like to extend a warm greeting to parents who are joining this meeting for the first time. Welcome, it's so great to have you here. And because what your perspectives and the perspectives of your children that you'll share are so important, I'll do my best to make this report as brief as possible. Before I speak, I would like to thank Marisol Rosales, our executive superintendent, for her tireless leadership and support during this time. We have had 189,000 cases of COVID-19 in our city, and we have had over 22,000 deaths in our state. This has been a very tough time to be a New Yorker, much less a systems leader. Marisol, if you are there and unmuted, would you like to speak now? I found her, so I have one. Great. Now. Okay, go ahead, please. You found me. Hi, Donalda. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm the executive superintendent for Manhattan and a very proud former um, high school superintendent for, for District 2 for um, seven years. So it is great to, to be here with you this evening. Um, I hope everyone in this call is well and safe. Uh, and I'm definitely sending love and strength to those of you who have been impacted directly by this pandemic. Um, what resonates for me during this crisis is the need to stay connected and in communication and, and, and stay hopeful. Um, today, more than ever, we need to be grounded in our values and humanity. Um, it is my hope that when we come out of this, we will be stronger leaders and, and kinder people. Um, and to just add to what Donalda share in, in terms of statistics and, and the state of our city, we are serving 450 meals a day um, across New York City uh, from the Department of Education. And um, we have 20 meal hubs right here in District 2 uh, and 57 across Manhattan. And I'm saying this because I do want to acknowledge um, all of our CEC members for their amazing effort in supporting our most vulnerable families and for creating this platform to bring information and resources to the entire District 2 community. Um, I also want to thank our, our teachers' energy and, and, and creativity uh, during this remote learning. Um, I want to thank all families for, uh, as I hear you tonight, for your patience uh, and for learning with, with us as, as we navigate this. Uh, I, I will encourage you to continue to communicate with teachers and principals as to what is working for your children and not working for them. Um, I want to thank our superintendent, Donalda Chami, and, and her amazing team for their work, energy, and effort. Um, to ensure our students receive devices. I want to share this number with you. Uh, in District 2, we have distributed 96.6% of electronic devices that needs to be celebrated. Uh, and our students' interactions continue to go up. We are at 96%. Uh, and, and that is uh, from 95% last week. That also needs to be celebrated. I do want to say this, uh, when we moved into remote learning, um, our students, our teachers, principals, superintendents, and, and you worked so hard to ensure that our students were receiving high level rigorous instruction and they celebrate all of you for doing that. So many of you are making sacrifices to be at home to teach your children what you're, what you're, what you're also, also working. Um, and I also want to share a different perspective. Um, we, we have children who have been impacted directly by this pandemic. 
Um, we have children who have lost their parents. We have children who've had to move to live with other families. Uh, Trauma-informed pedagogy is a reality for us in Manhattan. And it's something that we're learning side by side with our teachers. Um, and I'm saying this because these are the realities of so many of our students. And so this is different. When we come out of this, it will be a different place in how we lead, how we behave, how we treat one another is what's going to matter the most. Um, I'm here for a little while, Danelda, if, if there are any, any questions or anything that, that I can answer at the moment or any comments and inquiries, I'm taking my notes. I will bring everything with me so that you and I can strategize uh, and, and, and bring some additional uh, information and, and support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisol. I appreciate that very much. I know we all do. Um, Marisol had mentioned that we have a 96% daily student attendance rate. Um, that's right. We have 26,500 students in our district K to 12. And our data from April the 5th to May the 7th um, shows that 96% of those kids are interacting with teachers on a daily basis. Um, I will post the six ways that our chancellor and executive leaders at the DOE have um, are tracking student interaction and attendance, just so all parents are aware of what those metrics mean. Um, I think it's most important to know that we're in touch with 100% of our students. Um, we know where each and every child is right now. We know the child's home and family situation intimately. And even if kids are not able to fully participate in interactive lessons on a daily basis, our school teams still reach out to them and make contact. Um, as always, we are tracking the impact of our structures and practice on students um, in various uh, demographic subgroups. For students who are English language learners or multilingual learners for the past month, our daily interaction with those students has been 97%, one percentage point greater than the total. For students with IEPs, our daily interaction rate for the past month has been 93%. We know that that is a growth area and reaching and serving and continuing to engage kids who have learning differences and supporting their families and parents and doing that type of work with them at home is a central priority of our team at this time. For students who are white, our daily interaction rate is 97%. For students who are non-white, our daily interaction rate is 95%. For students who live in temporary housing, our daily interaction rate is 86%. That is another major area of work for us. I would like to extend gratitude to all of the members of our District 2 community for being so supportive of one another through this. Our CEC student member, Violet, and several of her PS3 alumni friends who currently attend Clinton, Baruch, and Brock Science have begun a student-to-student -student tutoring program for students in lower grades who need a little bit of extra peer support and interaction. We have principals who have hand delivered iPads to hundreds of students. One principal in the audience tonight even dyed his hair pink because all 850 of the students at his school turned in their April reading logs. They voted on what color he should dye his hair and it ended up magenta. Um, his video isn't on so you can't look for him, but maybe he'll put it on at some point. I don't know. I'm not going to name him though. That's a little rough, but thank you for doing that. Um, we have teachers and PTAs who have shipped books to the houses of students. We have CEC members who have picked up and delivered masks and gloves from schools to hospitals. Teachers who have volunteered to teach in our regional enrichment centers, those places that provide child care for our essential workers. And we have many PTA and CEC members who have worked to ensure that the basic needs of those in our community, including food, diapers, toiletries, and school supplies are met. Nobody is harder working or more deserving of our gratitude than our 49 principals and the teachers in our schools. There are many of those folks in our meeting tonight. And as I suggested in our last meeting, please, if you have a spare moment anytime soon, take a minute to write them an encouraging note. It will mean a lot to them. Finally, I would like to circle back on something that I asked last meeting, which was, 
that you please have some patience and gentleness with our teachers as we grow into the type of interactive tech savvy educators that we most want to be. This month, I don't, it really brings me to tears because you all have been so supportive and understanding and that spirit of generosity has pushed teachers so far and they have come so far in their practice. And I know that, that there are disparities between classroom and instruction in terms of confidence and skillfulness, but by and large, when I'm in classrooms and I see kids interacting with teachers, I can see the difference from a month ago and it is amazing. And so thank you for all of your support and kindness because really that brings people so much further along than criticism or judgment. And we have the best teachers in the city, if not the country. And I am so proud to work with them and I'm so grateful that you all are so supportive of them. So now I have a new request and that would be at this time, please be gentle with yourselves as parents. I woke up to this article in the New York Times today that was like every day is a struggle every day feels like eternity and i know that sometimes it certainly does nothing about this time is easy we are living with one article that i read what what's called the infinite present a temporal disintegration and it is a side effect of extended events of trauma these are jarring and sometimes monotonous, certainly overwhelming and always uncertain times. And yet they are the times that we have with our kids and therefore they're the most precious. So please be gentle with yourselves as parents and please continue to work with us, reach out. We are here for you and we look forward to continuing to serve you in whatever iteration of the system comes next. We're all in this together. Thank you for having me here tonight and I'm going to post that interaction policy into the chat now just so you can all see it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janalda. And, I, and um, I'd just like to say that I saw it in the chat earlier and because you mentioned our teachers and principals and because we do sometimes so much because all the members of the, the council are parents of kids, um, we do sometimes forget that our collective community here includes a lot of teachers and principals and school staff, and we're appreciative of you all being here. I've seen the names of principals uh, as, as, as our numbers were scrolling in, and I'm deeply appreciative of, all, of your showing up here tonight and to lend your voice and to hear what parents have to say, but also for all of the work you do um, all the time. Uh, and I've watched as, because I have four kids, my three kids in public school who are going through remote learning, um, I've watched that process grow and get better and improve and change and evolve. Um, and it's very, very impressive. Uh, so what are we doing? Okay, are we, uh, the next item I have on our agenda is a vote on our budget. That will Actually, require- Maude, Maude, yeah. just wanted to interject for a minute because I think there were a few questions um, from uh, speakers uh, that they were hoping to get potentially some clarity on. Um, I think it was around the functioning of wait lists, um, tours uh, for September, if there's any information there. Um, and also there was a speaker who asked about um, some of the struggles on remote learning um, and accessibility. Um, so I just wanted to see if we had an opportunity to answer those. Marisol, would you like to, uh, thank you, Eric, that's a great point. Marisol, would you like, I don't know if you were here at the earlier meetings, Marisol, on the wait list questions, but um, if, you, if you could address that, that would be great. Can we, can we unmute? Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. So our executive superintendent, uh, Marisol Rosales, you're unmuted. Yeah, can, can you hear me? That's that's great. Could um, yes. Eric, can you just share the, the the questions, please? There's something about remote learning, correct? In terms of access devices, or yeah, I think that there were three questions, and you know, and given you know the broad oversight both you and and Donalda have, it may not be a specific question you can answer tonight. But I at least wanted to go back to those questions from you know, the speakers, one was around the functioning of the wait list. Um, so as you know, obviously this year, there's wait lists for middle school and high school. And I think there's been some confusion, particularly as students see their wait list number increase. Um, and there hasn't been that much clarity. We've reached out to Office of Enrollment to try and get information, but you know, for the parents asking about that, 
um, I think it may be helpful if there's anything um, to add. Um, there was a second question about thinking to next year, which is probably you know a bit too off in the future, but if high school tours would function as yeah. they have previously. Um, and then I, my recollection was there's a specific question um, from a parent who um, has access issues. Um, and, you know, with, with remote learning and, and being able to see assignments, you know, based on um, a site impairment. Yeah, so for um, the, so the last question, definitely uh, reach out to um, the principal, if not Donalda, we have um, plenty of supports and resources at the Manhattan BCO that could be coordinated through the district team. So um, any, any inquiry that pertains to a school based in terms of support, principal, district, and then we could mobilize supports for sure. Um, as it relates to the other two, you know, it, it, we, this is a pandemic and there's a crisis. And so information varies from day to day. Um, I know that, um, the guidance around admissions policy. I know that Central is um, trying to engage as many stakeholders as possible in that conversation. So there isn't um, any information at the moment. Um, like you, you know, we, we continue to wait for guidance. Anything that becomes um, available and known to uh, me or Donalda will definitely share with you. But as of now, I don't, I don't have any um, specific answer to provide to those. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and to the extent um, the, the, oops, am I unmuted? Yes, that the um, Elijah Hobbs is the Zoom name. I just um, texted you, but it's the Zoom name of the family that had the question about access. You can, if you are, you can pass to me contact information that I can pass on. You can pass it directly to our superintendent Chumney via the chat. I just want to make sure that we have a way to follow up substantively with you because it sounds like Marisol has some suggestions for how to address those specific concerns. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, uh, I'll just make sure we try, uh, try to get that information before you get off. Um, okay. So I'm going to open it up to our council members now and say that um, there have been there's been some discussion amongst council members about our budget. The for those of you uh, who are interested, our CEC has an annual budget of twenty five thousand dollars. Our District Two budget traditionally does not spend much of that money, um, and. We're, uh, are left at the end of the year. The money reverts to the Department of Education if it's not spent, and we have tried in the past to spend that money in thoughtful ways. So um, since we have some different council members who have made proposals, I'm going to turn it over to those council members to speak to the issue of budget. Shino, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so one of the ways uh, parent leaders across the city advocated for is to target those unspent funding from CEC budgets to students in temporary housing. And we have an initiative in District 2 that are led by parent volunteers and member of the CEC, but separate from that, we know that we're going to end up with a lot of money that we're not going to spend. And we, I didn't want to see that go back to Central when that money could be used to purchase supplies and toiletries for students in temporary housing. The only way the central DOE worked it out is for the CEC to put that money back to the central budget, and then the central will purchase supplies and needed items for students in temporary housing. So um, memorandum went out to all the CECs, letting them know that if we want to set aside our part of our budget for that purpose, we can do that and we need to do it by tomorrow by 5 p.m. So I am recommending that we put $12,000, which we think will have um, unspent by the end of this fiscal year, towards this end and send it to central DOE to be used for purchasing supplies for students in temporary housing. I would second that motion. 
I have a proposed budget as well that I'd like to discuss before we vote on any budgets. Sure. Tom, we're going to go to everybody's um, uh, suggestions. Shino, can I clarify something from you? I thought the original proposal, is this different from the proposal for sending money to the ECC? That was, the, there was a proposal to send $1,000 to the ECC. Is this an expansion of that proposal? Or There's never been a proposal to send money to the ECC. It was the ECC who negotiated this deal with the central DOE, but the money goes back to central DOE. And central DOE will then spend the money and send the supplies to a variety of shelters. Yeah, can I ask you a question about that? Why, why can't we just buy the supplies directly? Um, do you know? I mean, I, I, I just fear it going to the central DOE. Can I finish asking my follow-up question and then we'll go around to each other? So, then I misunderstood because our money, if we don't spend it, reverts to central DOE anyway. So, right. so what you're trying to do is tag it so that when it reverts, you have some, our council has some control over how the money is spent. Yes and no. We are setting aside, in my proposal, it's $12,000. We're setting aside to be spent specifically for supplies in students in temporary, for students in temporary housing. If we do this and send the money back to Central, the Central will actually spend the money before the end of the fiscal year. They will then get to figuring out what supplies to buy, how to buy them, and which shelters to send them to. Now, they can do this if Central can actually pull together $30,000 from across all the CECs. And I think it will happen because I know that District 15 is voting on it. Um, they're sending probably five. District 16 is voting on it tonight. They're probably sending five. Um, CCHS is also putting somewhere around that amount. So we will hit that $30,000 pot for the citywide. And then the central will do the purchasing before the end of June. And Tom, to answer your question, um, we could do this on our own, um, but I'm not sure what the P card limit is. Okay. They wouldn't pay an invoice if uh, the, purchase order, the period for purchase orders is over. So <laughs> we can't issue any purchase orders. Yeah, that's so fair. So we if have to order everything from Staples or, you know, whatever using P card. Right. But you couldn't use a reimbursement though? There is a um, reimbursement there is a limit to 500 per person. Oh, okay. Right, and then if it's more than that, then you need to go through the approval process, which is possible, but you might be putting out your own money without yeah. the guarantee of a reimbursement. I'm just wondering what would be quicker. I mean, I just wanna get the supplies they need the fastest way possible. That's why I thought purchasing it directly might be easier than sending money back to the central DOE and so that, you know, wherever it goes. Right. Can I just ask, has there, has there been any discussion about a waiver of that money reverting? Mm -hmm. um, because we're going to be facing enormous budget. Uh, look, I'm not saying that these aren't worthy causes, but um, I was just curious because we're obviously going to be in a huge budget crunch for next year and everyone has their, you know, their, their concerns. I was just curious about whether or not anyone has discussed the possibility of a waiver so that um, don't, the money does not have to revert. Uh, at some point. We asked for that. We asked for unspent funding this from this fiscal year to roll over to next year, and the answer was no. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is dictated by the city procurement rules, so it's not just the DOE. And, and another question, sorry, um, who's going to monitor this, the, the expenditure of the funds? So in other words, who's monitoring that whatever we're actually donating to is getting to where it's supposed to go. So the central DOE promised us they will provide a report at the end of the fiscal year um, showing us how much money a variety, various CECs contributed and how the money was spent, which districts and how much money was spent in, that, in each district. So one of the things that I, I should tell all of you is that if we do this, there's no guarantee that let's say we put $12,000 into this, there's no guarantee that that $12,000 will come back to students in District 2. 
The money is going to get pooled across the city, across all the CECs that contribute, and the DOE will send the money to where the supplies are most needed. Um, hopefully, they will balance it so that every single district gets some of this pot of money. But 12000 from District 2 doesn't mean District 2 students in temporary housing will get $12,000 worth of supplies. I would contend that that doesn't matter what at all. I'm just worried that they won't actually spend the money on what we want them to spend the money on. Uh, they've done that before. So once it goes back to them, what guarantees do we have? We don't have a guarantee. Right. That's why I was hoping that we could go directly and purchase the supplies, like we're going to do the backpacks and books and things like that, and actually make sure the kids get what they need instead of it going into this weird void down in Tweed. Are there other council members who would like to um, speak to the issue of the budget? I mean, I, I'd like to introduce mine. Sure. I think I circulated around. Um, mine was based off of the money that we had spent so far to date. So I updated it for the money that was spent. Uh, it's very similar to she knows, except some line items, which I don't think we'll be using like more babysitting money. Obviously we're not going to use that. I just put it back into the general pot or into miscellaneous. The one addition that I did have was to get polling done by an independent third party polar. Uh, to see uh, a scientific polling to see what parents in our district actually think because I don't think that parents speaking during a public sp session or surveys done by any special interest group uh, be it one or the other um, are representative of what our district actually is and the DOE themselves don't con conduct scientific polling because I think they're afraid of the answers. So I put a proposal together. Uh, well, I didn't put a pro I asked for a proposal from a polling firm. They came back to me. They came back to me with two based on DOE spending, one under $5,000, so we don't need approval, and another with $8,000 that would give us more. I mean, I leave it up to the council to see what would be better, but I would really like to get a pulse of what parents in this district actually think instead of just relying on public sessions. I, I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that, but that was my feeling. So Tom, did you talk to Tiffany about how you can actually make this happen if we were to go this route? Yeah, so she said, I, I mean, I, I think you're on the email chain. That's all I know. I didn't talk to her on the phone, but uh, she said if it's under $5,000 and it's approved, it, they would pay it. But if it's over uh, $5,000, it needs to go through a bidding process which I'm happy to do, it would just take longer. We need two more bids. So it would right, be a uh, bid. Because we cannot do purchase orders anymore. Yeah, I, I advance So the you'll, have to, you'll have to advance it, and then you have yeah. to ask for a waiver because the advance or, or the, the in reimbursement maximum is $500 per member. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll put out my own money to make sure that we know what um, parents in our district actually are thinking. I don't have much money, but I'm willing to extend it just to make sure that that gets done. Hey, hey Tom, it's, uh, what yeah. exactly is the direction of this poll? Um, so I, I, I sent, again, I sent around the proposal that the polling company did to everybody. So you could read the questions. We decide on uh, amongst this council on a set of questions to ask and right. they would. You're yeah. saying uh, you want to find out what they think um, I want to see what parents in this district think of the DOE's COVID response. Okay. I want to know what parents in this district think about screening. I want to know what parents in this district think about gifted and talented programs. I want to know what parents in this district think about all the issues that we discuss at every single meeting. Okay. And if not, the money goes back to the DOE anyway. They might not reimburse me. So Tom, what was the amount again and um, that you were proposing? So there are two amounts. One was uh, 49.50, it's underneath the $5,000 um, threshold. So I wouldn't need competitive bidding, which I would recommend. But if anybody wanted to go out and solicit two more bids, 
I mean, we could do the 8,000, we could spend $8,000 on the vendor that we choose, but I mean, that would take more legwork. Um, well, I, I like to ask I just you, want to be, oh, go, go ahead, Emily. Go no, ahead. no, sorry. I just, it's, it, I find, you know, I mean, polling is only as good as the questions that go into it. And okay. um, we know that um, this council has a very difficult time agreeing and I can't imagine. So who would be sort of the decider? And I, I mean, the only way it would it'd have to go. To, so what the polling company could do is they could draft the questions. But to be honest, it would have to come up to a vote. And I know you're not going to like that because you're in the minority on a lot of these issues. But that's just <laughs> how it is. I mean, to be honest. Right. Thanks. I mean, yeah. Hey, can I just add quickly, um, you know, two thoughts. You know, this is money that is available to us until June 30th. So we've got about six weeks. Um, you know, right now, I think the priority is supporting students in temporary housing. And we're going to have a new budget that kicks in on July 1st of $20,000, $25,000. And I think we could certainly re revisit it then. But, you know, at least from my perspective, um, you know, right now we have a clear need and a clear focus um, and somewhere where our money could go to um, important needs and use. And we could revisit on July 1st, you know, when we get the new influx of money. I, 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 that's a reasonable point. I hear you. Um, but I think knowing what parents in our district think about these issues as soon as possible is very helpful because we're all making decisions right now which affect them without knowing what they want. And I think it's very reasonable to spend money that would have been spent on equipment that we wouldn't be using, which is the same amount, to spend it on finding out what parents in this district actually think. Um, I've got a few questions and I'm really sorry, I didn't have time to read your proposal, but I did notice- um, company. Well, well, yes, the, the consultant's proposal. I did, uh, but I did notice there's one, the cheaper option, the sample size is 300. Right. And the other one is 500. Right. And is that a representative, representative sample size for the universe of families, which if we have 26,000 students K through eight, we could at least assume there are 10,000 families. I think that would be a good ball game. I just sure. did a quick online sample size. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I, I don't know what this website is, but I'm getting, you know, close to 2000 would be the representative sample size for a scientific survey. For, well, I mean, you would, if you know statistics, you would have to know, would it be uh, the margin of error? What our 90, 10 sample confidence margin of the error is 2% no. and confidence levels 95%. Okay. So that's kind of high. Typically you use 90, 10, right? But let me ask you this. Uh, what was the ECC's polling method that you used? We Would didn't this... do a scientific survey. Uh, well, I mean, wouldn't this be a good first step for, I mean, why would, I, we, so 300 may be low. I don't know. We have to ask the polling company, but this would be better than anything we've done so far. Probably. And how about language access? Will they do translations in a variety of languages? I mean, I don't know. I, we'd have to find out. I don't think they would. I don't think they have the, the tools to do that, but we'd have to figure that out, absolutely. But then if we commit to 5,000, we may not get the variety of languages or we'll have, have to pay for the, the translation. translation. Do we have translators? If there's translators now, would we have to pay for that additionally? Maybe, I don't know, you mm -hmm. wanna throw right. three grand towards translators? That's fine with me. And how do we find the parents that we send the survey to? That's what the polling means. They, they do it randomly, just like any polling uh, you right. would do but, for politics. So the DOE has to give the consultants the database. Well, parents. I mean, the person, this company that has worked, has worked with uh, the NYPD or a sister company has worked with the NYPD before. I mean, it's a professional organization. They know how to access families. It's, it's done through I, I, whatever method they do, but they ask they look for a range of age of uh, kids and see if parents are in that range. I mean, from what they told me, I have had a few days to put this together, but again, it's better than anything we've done before. Hey, just, just again to intervene and appreciate the back and forth, but I think sure. to, the, to that specific point is that sure. we have an infusion of funds coming July 1st. We could start 
looking into the poll okay. tomorrow, you know, without and still use this money for students in temporary housing. Um, and I just think that, you know, we could be ready to move forward on July 1st, which is six weeks from now. Um, but I think we have a clear need and there's still unanswered questions about the poll that we need some time to look at. Sure. So I don't think it's anything that we need to dismiss, but if we need to make a decision tonight, at least my proposal is, you know, let's, let's move forward with the students in temporary housing and continue to work, you know, on the polling idea, which I think is sensible. So then why don't we just reserve, why don't we just lower the amount then? Because I don't know where the $12,000 comes from. Why don't you just reserve 6000 Because who knows whether that $25,000 is really going to be there in this environment. I don't know. Is it already allocated? So and I'm perfectly willing to agree to 6000 for students in temporary housing tonight. They reserve the money. If, if in June, as Eric says, we decide you want to give the rest of the money, that's fine to, to students. No, we, we, but no, we, we can't, can't spend it in June. I'm going to um, move us towards a vote on this. I'll share my opinion with folks uh, before we do. Um, I want to thank Shino Tanakawa for having done the legwork into researching how to earmark the money uh, last year. Uh, Shino put forth some ideas about our council using spending the money to also give uh, necessary items to students in temporary housing. She, you know, and I had a brief conversation about that where she indicated that, you know, it was better than not doing it, but it wasn't the ideal way to spend money. And I think it's always um, great when people take their experience from the year prior and try to improve upon it. And that's what um, she know has done. I'm grateful for the work and the effort. Um, I agree with Eric's comments about that Tom's proposal that we have a chance and I always do think it's great to look into trying to really understand what people in our district think because these meetings are a good barometer to some extent but certainly not don't give us a full and complete picture um, because I sit on multiple SLT student leadership teams school leadership teams rather um, and design surveys um, with other non-expert survey designers. I know the limits of surveys. Our, our schools do get some information from the surveys we design, but um, there are limits to, um, uh, to surveys to do really good polling. It, it, there's a lot required. Um, I think that it makes a great deal of sense to send our money to students in temporary housing who need the extra resources at all times and need it particularly now during this pandemic. So um, I would support the proposal. I'd also support the proposal of, um, of in the amount of $12,000 because frankly, our council just doesn't spend the money that's allocated to us and we're spending less of it now. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make, a, we can- Can I make one more point? Within my budget, there's $10,213 going to students in temporary housing. Not, not 12,000, but 10,200, because I added up what we've already spent. So there's not much of a delta there. We're just actually figuring out what parents in our district want. Well, can we put all 18 into students in temporary housing then? I mean- That's what yeah, I would like to do. I suppose we could, I mean, I know, but- um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I suppose we could, but that's not on your budget right now. I mean, we, we could amend your budget to do that, but, and we'd have to update with uh, Yvette, uh, because I think I just had data through March, so there could have been spending that I don't know about. That was the last time she sent around. Right, which is why I sort of padded my version, but I mean, you're the treasurer, so, yeah, you know, I if we have 18, we'll do, we'll, we'll do whatever we have, we think we're not going to spend. I'd love to put it into students in temporary housing. Yeah. Tom, your budget has uh, removed a lot of the unnecessary waste that we're spending on like uh, technology uh, yes. that we wouldn't be using in, in this environment. So, and that was like 4,500 plus. And then there's some other line items that is, is just a complete waste of money. So uh, we, can, we can't pass Chino's budget. It's useless. It's like we waste like, I don't know, $8,000 on that we'll never need. Well, I wasn't so sure some, if, you know, are you moving to modify your budget, budget to add additional money to students in temporary housing? Well, absolutely. One of the things that I wasn't sure about is whether um, Yvette might need computers at home or not. She seems to be doing okay, but if this remote learning continues and if she can't go back to the office, 
would she need any computers? Which, and I didn't, mm. didn't have the time to check in with her, which is why I left the equipment intact. I also didn't know if we had any members on the CEC who needed a computer, because that's another thing that the DOE is allowing us to do, is to purchase computers for CEC members specifically so that we can have um, remote meeting like this without having to use your children's computer or whatever it is. So there's a reason why I didn't touch the equipment. Um, okay. But if Tom, as the treasurer, if you think we don't need those lines, then I'd be more than happy to throw everything that we don't think we're gonna spend into the students for temporary housing. Okay, so we, I, I padded another thousand dollars in member, um, uh, whatever the member expenses are. And we have 2000 remaining in miscellaneous that I'm sure could go towards, I don't know what type of computer she needs, but $2,000 seems sufficient. I agree. And I also wanted to make sure Maud gets reimbursed for the, the Zoom fees that she's been putting out. So we need to make sure that's in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that could be miscellaneous between the Zoom fees and her computer. I mean, or we could just send uh, that uh, $700 iPad, which is apparently DOE protocol. But uh, I don't know. Well, wait a minute. I have an extra one because they sent me one that I didn't ask for, so we could just give it go. to her. Problem solved. <laughs> no, I've actually arranged with our uh, parent coordinator to, to send it back. Um, <laughs> Distressingly, I've heard that from several parents who receive iPads. Can I address time. Becky, who said she would not uh, trust a poll from this Tom guy? No, I'm Tom, not doing Tom, the Tom, poll. Tom, 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 we have to vote on our budget, so we're not going to address uh, <laughs> random yeah. comments right now. So I, I am going to ask Shino to, uh, if you, a modification for your budget. I don't know if you can, if we can, I'm going to just unmute Jennifer Greenblatt because okay. could we Could our, we just kind of vote on the end? You know, at the end, I think this is sort of. I want to vote, Eric. I'm moving us to a vote, which is why I unmuted okay. Jennifer Greenblatt because okay. she's a process person. And if I do anything wrong, she'll tell me. And I want to move to a vote. Um, What's your question, Maud? Um, I want, Shino had proposed a budget. I want to see if she can make an oral amendment to that budget right now. Why not? Yes. <laughs> okay, so Tom, uh, can we do 18,000 or do you think we need to set aside? Uh, well, I mean, if you want, you could just take what I put towards the poll and add it to what I put towards the students in temporary housing. So that's, that's 18,000. Yeah, that's what I would like to do. So okay, like to I, let we, I think there's no objection to that. Well, do I need to do, okay, hold on. Vincent, you're um, recognized. Do we, with that 18,000, is there any margin for things that might pop up for us, our group in the next two months? Or the margin is $3,000, basically. Okay. Um, unless there is a lot of spending in April, which mm -hmm. I doubt, right? I mean, I think it's really only Maud's Zoom cost, right? Right. I know, so, I know it does not need to factor into our um, discussion in any way. I have a hard time getting my receipts in as is. Um, so we, uh, I will try to do it because I try to be responsible, but I don't, but that's not, that does not have to be a factor. Oh, so, and I also have another $1,000 on the P card. I'm sorry. So th that's, 4,000 room. Great. Okay. So I'd like um, to amend my proposal then to 18,000. Second. Ushma seconds it. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to vote on mine. You can vote down the treasurer's uh, budget as well. If okay, you want. we can vote on yours next, but let's, um, what we have two, actually, I don't know if that makes sense. If we vote on the budget and approve it, we don't then vote on the second, right? Budget, right? Exactly. Um, Okay, well, <laughs> make a motion for either one. Make a motion for either one. We already had a motion and had Guys, it seconded for Shino's budget. So uh, no, I can put I mine voting. forward and you can vote it down. You go on record as voting Tom, down transparency. Gonna, Tom, there's I, a motion on the floor with a motion on the floor. A motion on the floor vote Tom. I'm trying to make sure that everybody's heard, but there's a motion on the floor. It's been seconded and we need to go to a vote okay. on it. So I'll start off. I vote in favor of the budget as proposed by Shino to give $18,000 to students in temporary housing via a, a, a negotiated uh, expenditure of the money to central DOE with the promise that they will spend it on students in temporary housing and issue a report to us on that expenditure. 
Uh, now I'm going to go down the list and I'm going to do it myself. Edward Irizarry. I vote in favor. That's a yes, yes from Edward Irizarry. Tom Rockledge. I'm going to go against. No from Tom. Yes. Vincent Hom. Uh, abstain. Abstain. Violet Beck. No, you're a student member. Robin. You know Brochier. what? Actually. Can't hear. Can't Robin Broshi. Robin, I can't hear you. Your volume's off or something. Yeah. No. no. Give Very us a faint. thumbs up if you vote in favor, Robin. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Robin. Yes. Now moving on to Eric Goldberg. Yes. Emily Hellstrom. Yes. Benjamin Morden. I abstain. Abstain. Ushma Neal. Enthusiastic, yes. Lynn Silverman. Len Silverman. You're on mute, Len. You're muted. Yes, but I want to see a report. I want to know where that money's going and make sure it gets there. <laughs> Shino Tanakawa. Yes, and I agree we need to track it and monitor it carefully. Great. The motion hey, Maud, is Maud, before you go, um, uh, one thing I was just trying to say actually is we, we, I know it's been a long time since we had a student member, but we actually always let them have a vote, even though it was symbolic. So I thought, I think it'd be nice to let uh, Violet take, you know. To take the vote? I, the vote. Um, I didn't want to put her on the spot because I know that it's not a binding vote, but Violet, um, I, we I would love to I don't even know if she's logged in, but, I mean, I know she's logged in, but I know sometimes we all step away, but. Yes, Violet, are you here at the moment? Is it? Yes, she is. I see her right there, and I'm going to unmute you, Violet. Hi. Hi, Violet. How are you? Were you able to hear the conversation on the budget? Yes, I was. Um, I would like to my like metaphorical vote, like a favor. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's a yes vote from our student member, Violet Becker, on providing the money for students in temporary housing. Excellent. Thank you, Violet. And I'd also just quickly like to thank Shino and Tom and Jocelyn Anker, who isn't on the CEC, but who has been doing just such a massive amount of work to link schools in our district with different shelters to advantage as many kids as possible. So thank you so much, Jocelyn, Tom, and Shino. And, and to yourself. We should have helped a lot as well. Started this process. Yeah. Yes, Ushma, thank you. Creating yeah. lists and linking the, the various shelter sites um, with the, the materials that they needed. So and thank, thank you. you to all of the schools and the parents who contributed Absolutely. and everything. It's been a community effort. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much to all the PTA parents who sent those lists on to their schools. Um, okay, so budget. We're up to agenda item number six. Any committee reports from um, anyone? Emily Hellstrom. Sorry, I just want to give a really quick um, committee report. We had a wonderful meeting on May 1st. Um, Can you state the committee, Emily? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I am the chair of the Students with Disabilities Committee. Um, we um, have people from all over the district come and join us, and everyone is welcome. Um, if you'd like to sign up specifically for that mailing list, I've just created a, a little mailing list so that, um, you know, I don't bog down everyone's email. It's SWD in nyc at gmail.com just so that i can send out one email um and we had a great meeting we had um three members from the division of specialized instruction um who are there giving a wonderful overview of some of the things that they've been trying to do but um most importantly we heard from so many families um in attendance who were both struggling and supportive and um, putting their insights into the chat and um, suggestions for people. And it was really felt like a community, um, which was something that we had been building um, up until this. And so I would urge you, if you have a student with dyslexia, ADHD, anxiety, processing disorders, anything, anybody, IEP, not, you know, please join us. Um, our next meeting um, will be Friday. Um, sorry, May um, 29th um, from 3.30 to 4.30. And um, we're hoping to get some um, suggestions for how to support your student over the summer. Um, we know that there are serious, serious um, 
learning um, issues that, you know, are setting, I mean, our kids who are with uh, disabilities already are, are behind, whatever that means, or they learn differently. For many, this is not the ideal setting. So um, we are hoping to get some, some ideas of how to support children over the summer, and then sort of what um, it will look like when we uh, get back in the fall and ways in which um, we can deliver um, you know, all of the diagnostic information to find out where students are and then also to be able to, to make progress. Um, so again, the email is SWD in NYC at Gmail. Um, we also send everything out through the CEC, but just to have like a little bit more targeted. Um, so thanks so much. Hey, I'm sorry, I need to interject. A 90-10 sample size on 10,000 is 68. Okay. Look it up. Sorry, I just- Emily, thank you for that. Thank yeah, you. I just wanted to also thank um, Donalda Chumney, who is incredibly, incredibly supportive um, of um, students that fall in this category. Um, she knows how systematic um, multi-sensory instructional reading and writing um, can really help these students and all students. Um, so we, I really thank her for attending and um, for always being supportive. Okay. Fantastic. We are actually moving right along at a wonderful clip and are ready for our second public session. So uh, do we have any folks signed up through the Google form? We do not. This might be a first of all time for CECD2. So um, that moves us right along to council discussion on resolutions. Um, okay. How about this? Um, I am going to suggest that um, do I have a great suggestion? Um, let's just take them in the order that they're listed on our agenda. The first resolution is 135, the Info Hub resolution. Eric, would you like to say something specific to that resolution? I know you spoke to all of them yeah. in the group. Yeah, so specific to this resolution um, is basically for the various items that we use for screening, there is data and transparency from the DOE on, um, you know, things such as test scores. We can see um, test score distribution by school, uh, by student populations. Um, the DOE does not provide similar data on grades. Um, and we've been having a conversation, you know, tonight and in the past, about you know, how we use grades within admissions. And I think it's important and integral to that conversation to understand how grades are actually distributed, um, get a sense on if there's variation by school, by student population, things such as grade inflation. Um, so I'd really like to know the information and the simple request is to the DOE to provide that same information they do for state test scores for grades. Okay, folks, I'm gonna uh, have, um, if there are other council members who wanna speak to this, let's- um, Yeah, I, I have an issue with, with this uh, resolution proposal. It's, uh, it doesn't mitigate issues with uh, de-identifying children. Um, it, it, if you're gonna have information provided by school, uh, you know, it, it could be problematic where a certain, someone's grades can be identified or, or uh, with a certain class. And, you know, if it's by district, if, if it's broken down by district, okay. But if it's broken down by school, then, then you run into uh, where, where individuals can be identified. And uh, I think that runs afoul of a lot of issues. I have to say, I had, oh, the, ahead, I had frankly the same concern. I don't behavioral scores and personal scores because there are a lot of student data privacy issues that are triggered uh, when we put more and more of our students' data and information online and make it accessible. And the more you, um, the less specific it is. Like if you can't, the argument you seem to be presenting here is that when you talk about 67% of middle school, school school seats are screened, 18 programs are screened, that you seem to be saying that we would want to use this data 
um, in that screening process or to understand it better or to have um, what you call an audited process. Um, in order to do that, you have to have very specific data about schools and grades and kids. And for me, that starts to call into questions. I'm not sure why a lot, you know, my children and all of your children's data is very accessible right now in ways that I don't think the DOE sufficiently protects their data. Um, and uh, this resolution to me uh, asks for even more of our children's data to be made accessible in public without any, um, without the kind of safeguards that I think we need. So I'm, uh, you know, very reluctant to, um, to sign on to something like this. Yeah, so I am, um, I, yeah. I, um, I, I mean, so we, we already know that the information that's already available on InfoHub are our student test scores. It's broken down according to different subgroups. Um, ostensibly that, the, the, sorry, the standardized test scores, ostensibly that's used for a lot of different ways. I think it was, it's born out of ideas about parent choice and how do parents decide, you know, learn about the school that, how, what, it's a way to, to get information about schools. So in addition to test score outcomes, we also see, uh, you know, like the results of the parent surveys and teacher surveys, the school environment surveys, all that is up there. The DOE is pretty good about suppressing data that doesn't, uh, that doesn't align with, uh, with privacy issues. So anytime we re even request data that they say, please don't share this with anyone, let alone put it on a website, you know, there's a little asterisk or an S if, if it's identified, if they think that there's anything identifiable. So anytime there's fewer than 10 people, so like if at a school in, you know, a certain grade, fewer than 10 people get a one, then there's an S. So you don't know, did one kid get a one? Did nine kids get a one? You don't know. So they, they suppress certainly information that, uh, that could be narrow enough that is identifiable. Um, and, and I also just, I think, you know, I think it's relevant. So I think it's, I think it's a useful tool for all of us as, 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 a, as a school choice tool, because as we know, a lot of people don't, don't put a lot of faith in our standardized tests. It can be another data point for families who want to have a broader understanding of what kind of performance there is. Uh, maybe families are concerned if there's a disconnect between test scores and grades. So there is an accountability mechanism that happens there as well when test scores, excuse me, when grades are shared and the and behavior grades are shared in addition to uh, in addition to test scores. Um, and you know, finally, I think the there's an advocacy piece as well. And I think there are a lot of different lenses of advocacy that all of us engage in. So some of us are focused on, you know, social and racial justice, and we might look at uh, student performance on these academic or behavioral metrics and say, why are all, why are black kids getting all these bad at behavioral grades and then that can help us do more advocacy around disproportionality around discipline for our black and brown children or at the same time it can be advocacy around why are kids from you know if we if we if we see there's like if we're if we're trying to advocate for equity around middle school admissions let's say this hours thing doesn't pass and we're going to continue to use academic screens we're going to want to be i think that there's merit in being able to see are there schools where there's a real misalignment in test scores and grades and where is that coming from and maybe we want to say that there's something in that school that there that that the, that the test scores that there it we are uncovering something like some sort of disconnect or grade inflation which i, I hate using that frame because i find it maligns teachers that i think are doing their best but i think teachers are also under a lot of pressure especially from anxious parents in the environment we're in so i i understand privacy concerns absolutely i just don't see how any of the data that would be disclosed in this context is any different than the test data that we're already disclosing and i and the doe doesn't disclose data if it they if it's identifiable and they have a track record of suppressing data frankly to my frustration and council members want to speak to that issue yes. 
Eric, I was uh, prepared to vote in favor of this resolution, as well as resolution 136 and 139. I'm all in favor of transparency and uh, making sure that parents know what requirements are, what a student has to achieve, and making sure that screens are not manipulated. And I thought that what you were driving at with this resolution is uh, a concern for the manipulation of these screens uh, and um, making the DOE produce this information would keep them honest and keep the screens honest and make sure that parents feel comfortable in knowing that these standards are fair and truly objective. That's what I thought you were driving at. But when I heard you speak today, uh, you know, um, in favor of all of these resolutions, it seemed to me that you were saying that you didn't want any screens and that uh, all screens were bad. Now, th this resolution 135 says that um, the parents here expect school leaders, the superintendent and the Department of Education to design and administer a valid and reliable screening process. I agree with that but you seem to be saying you don't want screens and all screens are bad. Now, I think that screens can be adjusted and fixed and I think transparency is good. And I think that institutions like educational institutions, Harvard, for example, you know, they do things and they discriminate against students like Asian students that do very well. And um, they do manipulate these admission screens. So I, I, I just don't understand what the spirit of this resolution is after listening to you um, sort of berate all screens and telling us and, and district two parents that we ought not to have any screens. So can you sort of reconcile your, you know, what you said earlier with what this resolution appears to say to me? Sure. Yeah, no, thank you for pointing that out. And the main point is some of these screens, uh, some of these resolutions do stand separately, but they do interact with each other. So we have a current system today, right, that asks us to put our faith in a screening process. But yet the DOE is unwilling to share the information that supports that screen. So we can actually understand whether those screens are being implemented fairly and equitably. And that is the purpose of the grading um, resolution. So it could be exposed um, to the daylight of analysis and review of the community. Now, we'll come back later, but my reluctance to the current screening process is that none of this information is out there. So we cannot trust the current process because we have no information available that allows us to understand how screening is being implemented. So, so this again, so the resolution is designed to to amend the process or fix it in some way. The car, if, if, if we stay with the current process, this would make the current process better, right, and give us more information. So both of these resolutions, the first two, are if you keep the current process, you make it better. Now, my point in the general resolution is none of this stuff is in place today. So we have no bearings to understand how the current screening process works, but yet we invest so much into it. And I am uncomfortable going forward with a process that we know nothing about that's poorly designed and poorly implemented. So these would be two steps to make it better. And that's what I'm asking for, is that we have a current system that we put ourselves through. These are very basic items that should be shared with the community. We should be sharing what grade distribution is across schools and across subgroups. And we should be sharing rubrics, cut scores, um, so students can understand whether rubrics were actually applied the way they were intended to. Hopefully that clarifies, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Can I j jump in just, I just wanna sure. speak in favor of this. Um, just because I think you have to look at them independently. Uh, I mean, you could be uh, for screening and still want information shared. 
it's transparency. Uh, I think that's valuable. Um, as far as the DOE, uh, you know, having sensitive information, they already have that information. And if they're going to, you know, uh, lose it anyway, they're going to lose it anyway. I, I mean, there's, to me, there's no harm in ha gathering information, letting people know about it. It's transparency at its core. So uh, I don't always agree with Eric, but this one's good, in my opinion. <laughs> So again, that's, that's the resolution, is asking the DOE to share data with the community that's used in a myriad of ways. So they have the information, they should share it. That's it. Okay, uh, just, Tom, I'll just address you with something. The, my issue with this is not with the DOE having it or the DOE losing it. Eric's resolution calls for making it public information, right? So, um, I think there's a line at which we draw in terms of how much information without safeguards of our kids' private data gets used. You know, there are all sorts of education companies and companies mining our students' data now that's available to them. I'm not convinced I want to um, give them more. You know, I hear you. They could still have a prohibition on mining student data. Right? I mean, but we don't have that right now, right? Lainey Hampson from Class Size Matters speaks to this frequently, and I tend to agree with her when she speaks about um, the need to protect student data. Um, I just like, want to be like clear. You, said, this is you don't always have to agree with someone all the time in order to. Um, I understand what the restrictions are now, Eric, but it doesn't change. No, I didn't say restrictions. I said it's descriptive data. It's not student level data. So none of the data that's shared for test scores, just like with grades, would be student level data. It's descriptive data at a school level and a subgroup level, just like with tests. And if the numbers were too small to be able to identify a student, they would suppress it like they always do. So, so it, it doesn't tie to an OSID number, right? Is what you're saying? Nothing that's published, of course not. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say something. So, I mean, Let's get real. I mean, let's really just get real. I think the comments that were made at the beginning by Eric, I mean, clearly summed up the, the, the underlying principle behind these particular resolutions, uh, which I personally don't agree with. I think that I actually agree with one of the comments in the chat that these are uh, resolutions that are primarily designed to incrementally uh, chip away at, at, a, at a admissions process under the guise of transparency. I think that um, if we need transparency, we need parents need transparency in knowing what rubrics we're going to have and knowing that the rubrics are going to be consistently applied and not changed in the middle of the night. I think that's where we need transparency. Uh, and I do agree that there can be differences in grades. There are going to be differences in grades from school to school. But I think this is just, an, again, um, this, it's the same group of people that have consistently, that are supporting the resolutions with one or two additions or subtractions here or there. They've consistently taken positions opposing screening. And it's not a coincidence that these are the same people that are sponsoring these particular proposals. So I am not going to be naive. Um, and I, while I certainly always speak in favor of transparency, I don't believe that, that these, these resolutions are really uh, on, on based on some underlying um, desire to really have transparency. I think they're more uh, designed uh, and I hate to say it, but I think they're they're more designed really to to provide um, some sort of data to potentially chip away here and there incrementally at screens themselves. So it's maybe argue that the algorithm, the formula, that there's something that can't be trusted. So um, that's why I am not in favor of these particular resolutions. It's but if, my, if, I could, I, if okay. screens have so much integrity, then why would it be scary to see that there's great inflation at a certain school? or that systemically black and brown kids are always getting dinged for behavioral grades that impact their ability to be admitted into these screen programs. Like, I understand what you're saying, Len, and I actually, like, I, I, share, I share your distrust in that, like, you know how I feel about this. I, I mean, like, there's no secret. And obviously, like, I want data that's gonna help me make my case but i want to make a case based on data and i don't understand why 
I, I, it makes me uncomfortable that you feel like this is a good idea in theory, but if it helps make the case against something I believe in, then I don't want that information disclosed. Like, let's get it all out there and then have a conversation about whether knowing how grades are distributed across the district, across different schools, across different subgroups, that screening still has merit. Why would we say like, oh, I love transparency, but I don't like your motives. That the data should be there and then we can talk about it on its merits rather than like what you think about my underlying beliefs and the reality too is look i'm not i'm not like completely deluded i know what the i know what the landscape in, in district two is and i know how i know how important screening is to the culture and i know the earnest held belief among families that it is best for students. I understand that and I never ever doubt that every parent that comes to our meeting is fighting for what they believe is best for their students, their children, even if I disagree. I know we all want what's best for children, but I, and so understanding that and understanding that screens may be the lay of the land, we have to have data available to make sure that they are going to be fair. And we can't do that if the DOE is sitting on all this data. It sh even if I think it's fair, it's not fair, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be as fair as possible. And hiding this data really reduces the possibility of having fair screens, of making sure parents understand how these decisions are getting made. We had a public speaker earlier who was convinced that the wait lists are being moved by, you know, not by algorithm, but by, by a guidance counselor, or excuse me, not by guidance counselors, but by a person in central. I don't know that that's true, but the more information that we just that we keep hidden from families, the harder it is for people to have faith in the system, regardless of whether you think it's appropriate for like, regardless of all of the discussion about race and social justice and integration, if we had a completely homogenous district, we need to have that data available so that parents have faith because we Come on, we all know what happens in the schoolyard and at lunch and everybody's whispering about how this principal got that one in and this one's sibling got in because they, you know, gave so much to the PTA. And I think it's fair to have that data available so that we have faith that in this system that is subjective and icky, that it's, as, that it's actually as fair as possible. I would also just add that this cuts across race, um, socioeconomic, the, like there are many, many parents of, of all different walks of life who find this system um, very untransparent. So when they get handed um, their child's middle school, um, the school that their child got into, it is a complete an utter shock because they thought they didn't realize that in order to get into you know whatever school it was that you had to have every single um, you had to have a four in every single category. They thought, oh well, my my kid's you know a very good student and works very hard, which is like you know everyone thinks their student you know I mean I guess some parents don't think their children work very hard, but most parents see their children working very hard, whether they get a one, a two, a three, a four. Kids are working hard to be their best. The fact is, though, that the parents, you know, they put in an application, they don't know that you have to have a four in everything. And, and you know, they need to know, they need to understand what is going on it, with, with the entire system, and they don't know. So we're just talking about 135 right now, yeah, right? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a time issue, which is yeah. that we have a lot of resolutions on the agenda and um, uh, yeah. So I am gonna jump to parent input on admission policy because it's a timely admission because the DOE has indicated and told us all uh, in both at the PEP meeting from the chancellor himself, as well as our FACE liaison, Michelle Chang, at our Tuesday check-in with FACE, that the admission policy decision process, the parent engagement process such that it is, is happening right now. So I'm gonna jump to that one for discussion. Um, Eric, if you wanna have a vote on the Info Hub, we can do that now, or if you wanna wait uh, 
I think we have to wait for one more public session after we talk about it, but I'm not no, sure. No, no one signed up for the second no. public session, Eric. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so we Sorry, are- Sorry, one, one person did, but we already were supposed to have had the public session, weren't we? Yes, but there should be one after the resolution of uh, the uh, discussion on, on resolutions. Um, well, so the person marked down that their comment was about admission screen. So if right. we are, then it should be after the resolution that you're okay. about to present, Maud. Um, okay. So moving on, it's a short resolution and it's about allowing district specific admission policy and meaningful parent engagement. District two is a different district than a lot of other districts in the city. And I will say that some of the CEC members on this council who have been here for years, um, Robin and Eric and Shino uh, have been here longer than all the other council members have advocated for and worked on the admission screens that we currently have now for years and years and years. And a lot of the changes that we have are the direct result of um, parent advocacy and parent input. This issue has ignited a huge number of parents in District 2 to say that they don't want to get rid of these screens. I know there is opposing viewpoints and I know there are people who um, want to get rid of all screens. It is, these are somewhat familiar battle lines to those of us who have been in this education conversation for a long time. Um, but I'd also, as I pointed out, I don't know if folks were able to hear me earlier, um, we were looking at, we have been looking at how to effectively meet the needs of parents in District 2 who have said again and again and again, based on the schools that they apply to, the kinds of schools and the kind of education that they are looking for. We need to meet that need and we need to do it in a robust, um, wholehearted way because that's the obligation that this school system should take seriously is honoring what parents are looking for in the education of their children. And instead of telling parents, you're wrong to want what you want, you're scared, you have a scarcity mindset, you this, you that, I think maybe we should listen to families and kids and parents who, um, you know, including many of the members here who say we should get rid of screens, but send their children to the same schools that everybody else sends their kids to, um, because there's something in those schools that parents find valuable and um, desirable and important and worth um, going through the trouble of trying to get their kids into. Uh, this resolution also acknowledges the fact that our, we've spent years working on an integration um, uh, project based on the rubrics that our district has right now. Um, and, and for anyone who's thinking, and I'm sure there are some who say, why is it taking you years? Well, we've been following the path that's been laid out for us. The New York State Department of Education has a multi-phase uh, integration pilot for which our district has applied and reapplied repeatedly and gone through all of the steps um, to access the money that's been provided uh, for developing a district specific integration plan. We've done really good work on that. I'd like to see it come to fruition. Um, and I'd like to see parents' desires to have enough screen schools and enough zone schools to provide all the children in a district. Um, I'm bleeding into my other reso a little bit, but to provide the kinds of education that parents need, districts should be listened to. And, um, you know, our district has specific needs. We have kids who, um, along with a few other districts in the city, perform particularly well and are looking for an education that matches um, their, uh, you know, the, the high quality middle schools that we have right now. Not enough and not a sufficient number, but we have some, you know, as parents said, there's a real drop off sometimes for some kids from middle school to high school um, and a process that's just really hard to navigate. And so I think we should be able to develop, we, we need parent input and we need district specific admission policies for this upcoming year. And I think that's what makes the most sense for our district. And that's what that, that's what, that's a long explanation for a very short resolution. That's what that one is. And I'll open it up to parent, to a council member comment now. If there's no council member comment, we'll move to a vote on the two resolutions. Um, the Info Hub resolution followed by the- Wait, 
Hey, oh, sorry, Mark, sorry, can sorry, go through all the rest? Do we, yeah. Um, we so need to we, do our, 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 I think our one person parent. Uh, no, segment. but also could, Maude, could we go through all the resolutions? You usually do that as a group and then we yeah, go back. Yeah, I do. Session. I don't know that we're going to have the ability to get through all four of them by 10 o'clock tonight. And so I wanted to vote on those okay. that we've discussed, but we can certainly squeeze in one more at this point, Eric, but then I am going to move to a vote on the ones that we have discussed. If you would like to choose the next one, Eric, I'm perfectly fine with that. We have to end at 10 or yes. It's, it's you do? We discussed at our working business meeting that we are kicked out of physical buildings at 10 o'clock. And um, uh, I think it makes sense to end at 10 o'clock. Shino Tanakawa had mentioned perhaps calling a special meeting next week so that we could um, continue to discuss some of these resolutions. But I think, um, you know, people over four hours yeah. should become a very long meeting. So. Why don't, Eric, why don't you pick the next resolution since you've written most of them that you want to discuss? Yeah, yeah. so the next resolution, um, well, I, I, well, first, I think we should pause and realize that we have resolutions that we've discussed tonight and we should go through them all. Right now it's 926. I don't think we have a hard stop at 10 o'clock, but um, let's see what we could do. So the next resolution I wanna talk about in order is around, um, releasing detailed information on middle and high school processing match, uh, high school matching process. Um, as we discussed earlier, um, there what is, is little that, no transparency. Which number? 136. 136. Okay. It, it asks, makes the simple ask that all middle and high schools publish uh, a complete and comprehensive rubric for how they evaluate students that will allow families to independently calculate their students' rubric score, um, and then goes further to ask those middle and high schools to actually publish the lowest rubric score that match to each school, program, and applicant type. Um, and I think that this is just the basis. If we're gonna have a screening system in place, parents and families should know how their students are evaluated and what their student score was, and what was the last score that matched to a school. Without that information, we can have no real trust in the process. We saw last year in District 2, there were three schools that uh, errors were identified at. And I assume across the city, across the district, across years, there have been many, many other errors. And parents and families should be able to understand um, whether uh, the rubrics were applied in the right way. This is information that's easily available and accessible um, and should be released. And it's, um, it's shocking to me that it hasn't been. Council members. I agree. I agree as well. The transparency is really critical. And, and I mean, I just underscore that it's outrageous to me that, um, you know, the DOE continues to look the other way um, and not share this foundational information um, with families. Why do you think so? Why do we think what? Well, why do you don't? think that? Why do you think they don't want to share it? Or, or why, why do you, I mean, uh, what's why, their why? motivation? I think because the process has tons of errors and mistakes and they would all be highlighted if parents had the information. And so how do you want to use this year. information to get rid of screens? I, I, there are two separate specs then, okay? I mean, I just- No, no, but very you've said that, you like said that people, you're opening, I, I you're want, opening monologue. I, I do want, I, I do not believe in screens, but given that we have screens, I believe there should be transparency. There's no other agenda for that other than recognizing the, the, that this is a, a difficult process and parents should be able to know and kids should be able to know, hey, why or why didn't I get into this school? Very simple. 
I just find it ironic uh, that you want transparency, but you're not being utterly and entirely transparent either. Ben, if you wouldn't mind, I think that what Eric is actually probably trying to do is to get several of us who are kind of straddling many of these things to agree on one thing that this... Oh, I think that I agree that there should be transparency, but when you have your opening monologue against screens and then okay, you're but, doing but this... We're, we're discussing this one resolution, and so vote your conscience on whichever of the resolutions you want, but this one I agree with because it is limited specifically to this bit of transparency. Right, so one party is more on screening, I'll be against that, but. The important thing to remember is that the errors last year that happened both at, with the way the screens, the way the, um, there were errors with lab high school and lab middle school that had that caused huge impact. I, I, I don't, I'm sure everyone sitting on our council right now, whether they were on the council or not, is aware of how excruciating and painful and upsetting that was for families to find out you didn't get into your school. Oh wait, you did get into a school. Oh wait, those families have two choices. Oh wait, maybe I would have gotten into my school, but there's this like ripple effect with the way the offers work. The only reason that information surfaced is because some tenacious parents were hounding their principal their middle school principals and the middle school principals happened to get on a phone call or in one case it was it happened to happen to the president of a pta at a high school who just pulled the principal aside based on a personal relationship and said you know what this really doesn't add up can you please go back and check those are the ones that we know about and it relied on character of parents involved who just were like, I don't care what people think about me, I'm going to pursue this to the ends of the earth, or a parent that had a personal relationship and felt comfortable with the principal. That is not how accountability should work. That is not how we should go through putting our kids through this excruciating process, whether you believe the payoff is worth it pedagogically or not. It is, it is hard on children to put them through this and then and and the gall and it makes still makes me angry of the doe to tell us at a meeting that they think they've identified all the problems but oh no wait after school ended in july we find out that beacon made a mistake that went completely under the radar because nobody because there were no meetings there was no press about it how many of these mistakes are happening all the time? It's infuriating. And you can be in favor of screens, but you should damn well want those screens to be valid and you should want them to actually, like the way they say they do it, they're doing it. And the DOE doesn't have the resources to do these checks. If they just tell parents, this is how we calculated your child's score and this was the lowest score, then all of a sudden there's the accountability that was missing. And I understand, back to my point to Len, you can question whether I wanna use this information to destroy screens. I wish I was that powerful. I'm clearly not, or we wouldn't even have screens. Every parent going through this process should have confidence in its integrity. And this is about making sure the process has integrity. Uh, can I ask a, a question uh, just to interject? So the last meeting, April 28th, we talked about grading resolutions for three hours. And then the following morning, the DOE put out their position. I guess this question goes to the group, but especially to group members who have special access. My question is, did you know that that decision had already been made at the time? And right now for screening, do you know if that decision has already been made? right now, I guess. I'm throwing it out to anybody in the group, but I guess we'd go to Shino, who has hey, Tom, the most I'm just gonna interject for a second. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. it was already printed in the papers before our meeting <laughs> that was it? the grading decision had been made. Yes, it was widely uh, reported. Why would we so, talk about it for three hours then? Well, I think everyone the else in the panel time. could agree that it was, it was, it was published. Oh. Okay. Can you can you provide that information? Because I did not see that anywhere. Nobody said it was the next day. The announcement it was the next day. No, it was leaked prior. And to answer Where? your question, Tom, I would love the, to see that. Yeah, the answer is no yeah. and no. And when you have the meeting as the place with the chancellor tomorrow, you should ask him. 
Um, I, well, I won't be there, but um, ask, well, I, you I have will. Five colleagues on the CEC representing oh. place, so you one of them can ask. Okay, I'm just asking if decisions had already been made. I actually think the information came out after our meeting. Yeah. Um, but uh okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. So uh but but it was immediately after, which was certainly disheartening to parents. Yeah. Um oh, okay. not on this topic because I don't think that's productive, but I just want to say the irony of this whole thing is the reason that errors were discovered was because parents who knew that their child had, for example, a ninety-five average and perfect fours didn't get in when there was a published rubric um, they were able to determine that hey what there must be something wrong here because my child had a perfect score and didn't get into x school which was their first choice the irony is when you if you lower everything to an 85 and above you never will be able to find any errors because you've increased the um you've increased that um th that that pool to cover such a wide swath of people to reduce any bet any um any uh differentiation between uh, the students so it, 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 there's a little irony here because again i you, there was there's a predictability knowing that if if, if a certain child has uh, an x grade that is within the rubric they're going to get into a certain school but if you the, when you keep on lowering that you remove that predictability so i'm just saying these errors i think were found because people realized hey this doesn't make any sense because my child should have gotten their first choice, maybe their second choice, but why are they not getting their choice, way, why are they getting a choice way down the list? So Actually, there really isn't any predictability. I think that is one of the issues, right, is if you share this information, there would be some more predictability because there are, there are families who say, hey, my child had a 97 average, and I assume that that is very high, right? But the reality is that at some schools, that's the 25th percentile potentially so i mean i think it's just very clear we want this information right parents need this information okay i'm gonna move us on if we don't have any further comments to the screening moratorium resolution draft 140 eric that's your resolution you want a moratorium on all screening would you care to address it further or rely on your earlier uh remarks i would like to address it further um and i'd really like to get feedback and have a discussion with the council, you know, we, uh, we listed and identified um, a detailed set of issues around the design and implementation of screening. And I am curious, right, how this group decides or, you know, if this group actually thinks that um, screening is designed and implemented well today. Um, and if not, how could we continue to put forward a system that doesn't have basic design or implementation um, behind it? So why would we want to put another set of students and another group of, of children through a process that's designed poorly um, and implemented poorly? Can I answer your question? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think if you put, would have put together a resolution improving screening, I'd be all for it. There are certain ways that you can improve a system, but to get rid of it right now, when our, we have a budgets that are gonna be slashed, class sizes could increase. You're making it more difficult for students to get access to teachers. If you're not screening students, you're bringing all different levels in. Maybe you could do it through tracking, I don't know, but just I, to me, if you wanted the system to be improved, I'd be all for that. And there are certain ways you can do it. I was for your uh, getting rid of absentee screening. I'm all for that. But to, just to get rid of a system completely seems to me like you're taking advantage of a national or a global health pandemic to get something that you wanted before. So that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll just add that it's not related to the pandemic. Um, you know, this is something that um, been thinking about for a long time. I do believe that this is, um, we need to reflect right now because all of the tools that this system required are not available. Um, and that leads us to think and reflect on, well, you know, should this, should this system be in place? And I feel like we enumerated a long list of flaws and I'm not comfortable keeping a flawed process in place and having our children go through a process that really has, 
you know, limited value and we see, we see all of the errors and we're just going to say to kids, hey, this is a system that doesn't work, but hey, you should go through it anyway. It yeah. doesn't really tell us anything meaningful in terms of, you know, differences and it's not implemented well, but give it a shot. Okay, Perfect yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I would like to have, I would like to make a comment. Great, sure, Emily, and after Emily speaks, I'm going to say something. Okay, um, so just, you know, it, it's a little bit off um, it, it's, it's on the screening topic, but it um, has to do with many of the families who um, in our committee that we come across. My son is dyslexic. Um, and as I've learned about the science of teaching reading, um, um, we know a lot about it. And unfortunately, it is not happening in our school currently. And we know that only 40% of kids are able to learn to read um, no matter what. And the other 60% of kids, whether they're dyslexic or just regular kids, um, they, they don't actually, they, there actually has to be a science of teaching reading. And we currently do not have it in our system. And if you don't fall in that 40%, you are either tutoring your kids, test prepping, helping them some way, and you are getting them in there. If you don't have those resources or ability to do that, then you are basically not going to move. This science of reading has been around for a long time. It is you know, documented over and over and over again. We need structured, systematic, um, Orton-Gillingham-based um, reading and writing. It's a multi-sensory system. We must have it in our school system. But at the same time, we can do that and integrate our school system. We need smaller class size. There are things that we can all agree. The fact is, is that our students deserve more, but the, but the other, it's not just some students deserve more. It's all students. We can all come together and we can do it. It's a three-legged stool as far as I'm concerned. It is smaller class size, a systematic instructional uh, reading and writing and, and integration. And we can have an incredible school system. You can start integration in kindergarten. We're not going to get smaller class sizes because we don't have the money. That's absolutely true. And whether we want to recognize that or not, we want to recognize it or not. But we're not getting smaller class sizes now when the budget is getting slashed. No matter what resolution we pass, it's not going to change the revenue coming in. I'm a tax attorney. I see the revenue coming in New York. It's not going to be there. I understand. The one other follow-up that I would just say is I don't know how many of you went, I mean, I went to public school my whole life. We never, I, I didn't go to middle school that was screened. I, I mean, I just, I, this is a unique to, to hear and I don't know why we think it needs to continue and that the world will fall apart if it doesn't continue. The fact is everywhere all around the world, it isn't in place and people are not, you know, exploding or something like we can do this. So if you integrate from the- Hey, hey Tom, 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 okay. we're gonna let all members have a, a, a chance to say something. Um, what I'll say about, the, I think some folks know what I think about this, but I'll just share my thoughts. You know, District 2 has a lot of really, really, really good schools. It is still a district in which parents and kids and families struggle to get through the process because we have inexplicably not looked at the schools that are great and that people like and try to replicate them. There has been this reluctance and this fear, especially in the last, um, during this mayoral administration, to not do what Michael Bloomberg did. Michael Bloomberg did some things not so great for our school system and some things well, but he did certain things like, he looked at our three specialized high schools that people loved and said, let's create more and created five more high schools. Staten Island got a specialized high school that they didn't have before. It's an enormously successful school that serves the needs of the kids in Staten Island. In District 2, we should be saying these are the schools that parents want, that they value, that are very successful. Let's create more of them, right? There are kids outside of District 2 all the time that try to get into District 2 schools because the schools are seen by kids and families as good. They want them, they desire them, they like them. And we don't have a mass exodus of voluntary kids leaving District 2 to go to, with the exception of specialized high schools, to go to other schools. We have folks who are here, um, you know, who want them. Another point I'll make is that folks forget to think about how screen schools started. 
right? Like the public schools were at a point where nobody wanted to go to them and people were, there was exodus out of our school systems. Screen schools were put in place. It's in district two, the middle school screen school system was put in place to bring families back into the system to say, we're gonna give you some choice about your, where your kids go to school and give you some ability to look at the kind of school that's right for your kid. And it's been enormously successful. We have, you know, uh, an enormous number of schools that people like so much, they try to get into them from outside the district, from everywhere. We should keep doing what we've done well is create more and better schools. There's no reason to say we have to get rid of everything because the screening process isn't always as transparent or perfect as it should be. And I agree there are problems with it, but the schools themselves are really good schools and that's what we need to focus on. The education itself is really good. I'll also say this about parent input. The fourth grade and seventh grade parents who have come and spoken up again and again and again at our meetings and send emails to us and reach out to us and reach out are all saying, don't get rid of grades, don't get rid of screens, don't throw out the Rubik's. We have heard it again and again and again, overwhelmingly from fourth and seventh grade parents. And those are the families that are going through the screening process. Ultimately, our CEC is supposed to listen to the parents in our district. We all have our own opinions and we all have our own ideas, but we are supposed to be responsive to the parents in our district. And I think we should do that. And for those who say, and I've heard this many times, people are afraid of what's gonna happen next. I don't see a lot of afraid people. I see a lot of highly educated, smart people who have made thoughtful decisions just because they're different than the decisions that you're trying to make for other people's kids doesn't mean that they're afraid of anything. And I'll say this also, principals in our district and throughout the city have a tremendous amount of latitude in how they um, uh, make decisions in their school. And lots of principals have held on to their screens and have used them and, um, you know, design a curricula and design a program around the screens uh, that they have, right? Like there, is, there are educators who, while they may not be saying it in such full-throated ways right now, um, know that there's a value and um, you know, a use for grouping kids of like uh, proficiency levels together. And um, there's real educational value in it. So um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why District 2 screen schools have been enormously successful, why parents like them, and why they want them. I will also say that for anyone who thinks that screen schools are terrible, we have zone schools that folks can go to. So it's not like you're being forced to go into a screened program if you don't want that. There are zoned programs. So um, we, so that was what I had to say. I'm gonna let anyone else who wants to speak on this topic. I'd like, I'd like to, to hear, I'd, I'd like, like to, to go next. Sure, okay. I, let me ask if there are any voices from our council that we haven't heard from that want to speak. Well, I can talk and then someone else. And then actually I know Violet wants to talk. She can go. Violet, do you have something to say? I'd like to let Violet go. Violet, oh, I need to unmute you. Sorry about that, Violet, hold on. I'll go, go. Um, after Robin. Okay. Like, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna keep you So I actually, you know, obviously I anticipated the conversation we had, we're gonna have tonight. So I, I actually wrote out my comments so they won't sound extemporaneous like my earlier comments, but perhaps they'll have more of a cohesive narrative. So maybe we will all win. Um, so, my daughter started kindergarten at PS11 in 2010. And one of the first lessons we all learned is how important it is to be kind and gentle. So that's a phrase that every PS11 student and their family member knows from like the minute we start PS11. Kind and gentle is the mantra. And it's, uh, and it's like the lens through which every decision is made. Uh, so, and I, I was on the SLT and you know, every, dis every time we talked about CEP or anything that came through, it was like kind and gentle is the guiding principle through all of our decisions. And to be clear, kind and gentle doesn't mean, it doesn't mean not challenging children and it doesn't mean not pushing ch kids out of their comfort zones. It's this acknowledgement that these are the, found the foundational conditions required to guide us to successfully bring the best out of our children when we challenge them and we put them out of their comfort zones. We have to be kind and gentle with them. And I know to the extent any of you who know who I am, 
um, you think of me as this like social justice warrior that's always like everybody's racist and everything's about race and um, maybe some of you don't think that's a positive. I wear it with a badge of pride. But um, my issue with the way we assign students to middle school is actually one of the issues that first brought me into the CEC like seven years ago. And I actually had no idea about systemic racism. I didn't understand its impacts. I was just a white lady with a kid that was trying to understand why we had this process the way it is. And the fact is that our middle school enrollment policy in District 2 is neither kind nor gentle. It's crude and it's cruel and it's mean. And I don't think it has any pedagogical merit. We have amazing elementary school teachers and principals, just like at PS11, who use guiding, kind and gentle as their guiding principal. These, these leaders and educators exist throughout our district and they take whichever kids walk through their doors and they engage with them and they inspire them and they challenge them and they educate them on their own merits. And District 2 has been engaged in discussions and professional development about integration from academic and racial perspectives for years now. This is training that our, our leaders go through. Our middle schools have met targets for accepting students with disabilities for over five years. When that was introduced, the idea that a school like Salk or or Eastside Middle or Elro would have to accept students with disabilities with IEPs was gonna, they thought it was gonna destroy the school. How are those small schools gonna be able to educate kids with special needs? But in fact, they rose to the occasion. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know many of the middle school leaders in our district over my years, both on the council and also just as a parent, I now have had one child that went through district two middle school and one child that's just started a district two middle school. I have no doubt that District 2 middle school principals and teachers have the same capacity to engage and inspire and challenge every single child that walks through the doors that our elementary school leaders currently achieve. There is no reason to put children through the cruel, competitive, and unreliable admissions process that pits them against their friends and their peers, that labels them, that sorts them. I've heard that this process is necessary to motivate and reward students who work hard. I've heard that tonight, academic students should go to the best schools. But we can't make that argument without acknowledging its flip side, which is that the students who don't achieve placements in quality schools can only conclude that they're bad students, that they're gonna be demoralized and discouraged by that label. And I wonder how many scholars do we just completely lose at such a young age? How many kids disengage with the educational process? Because they've been told when they were 10 years old that you don't get to go to Salk because you didn't get all fours. When the adults that our children admire, their principals, their teachers, their guidance counselors, their parents, and the system we all continue to prop up tell students that they live in a meritocracy. The message sent to all students is that there's some kids who just don't have merit, that there's some kids who just don't deserve to go to the high quality school or the good school. And I know I sound overwrought, but I'm gonna quote from an email that we received into the CEC from a District 2 parent just two years ago. While District 3 and District 15 were starting their discussions about reforming middle school enrollment, the parent wrote, an admission standard should seek the best students in underrepresented groups rather than the worst. The middle schools should be entrusted to pick the best students from these demographic groups. Schools should be picking the students that have worked the hardest and demonstrate the most capabilities, the students most deserving. And I cannot abide by a public school system that decides which kids deserve to go to certain schools which is why I am in favor of a moratorium on screens. I'm in favor of ending all screens. I have, I have absolutely no reservations about supporting this resolution. Do you know what cognitive dissonance is? 
Um, Tom, I'm going to go to Violet. We can discuss that fascinating concept next after Violet. Violet, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. Um, so I was taking notes throughout the meeting and I've also, like, I came up with some of my own opinions on screens. So um, I'm a student representative of the CC and I'm also a member of Teens Take Charge. Um, the truth is that our school system isn't equitable and that's clear. And I feel like it's not a yes or no, but rather it's more of a how are we going to improve this system. Uh, I hope that we can all understand that there are real problems with the screening process and students with greater access to resources from more affluent areas stand to benefit from their more well-funded schools and communities. Still, there are great schools. I personally have gone to Clinton Middle School and Clinton High School, and the population isn't very diverse. Um, I am Middle Eastern and I'm probably I'm like one of the most diverse students there and we can all acknowledge that screening has rewarded those that are more at that are in more affluent communities than students in lower income communities and they should have the same opportunities. I think we would all like the school system to be more equitable across socioeconomic factors. I don't think that's a point of disagreement. I think that it does not have to be a but I don't think it has to be like a yes or no question. I think we should discuss how to approach this so we can bridge the gap between the current inequitable system and a new more equitable system. I believe that screening and the way that we do it needs to end. There has been a lot of good points made today, but I want to make sure that both sides hear each other because whether or not there's an up or down vote today, this is a central issue for our communities and we need to further discuss this to make a more equitable system. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you know, Maud, Maud, I haven't spoken in a while. I just wanted, I, I just, I almost. What just happened? Wait, wait, wait. Oh. What so. just happened? Did I do something? Are we, oh. are we unmuted? We were frozen, Len. Oh. I almost caused in a riot two years ago when I just asked a simple question at a CEC meeting of the formally constituted board which is where CEC members send their children to. And I wasn't trying to be facetious, I wasn't trying to be obnoxious, um, because the, the, the point that I knew the answer uh, was that the same people that are the strongest proponents of eliminating screens either send their children to gifted and talented programs, to screened high schools, screened middle schools, uh, and, and that's fine, because we all want the best schools that, for our children. But, it, it, in, but that's where the energy should be. I, I think we, the energy should be to make, as Maud said, to make all of the schools that level of performance, to make all of the schools um, as attractive to parents, to have the level of teaching uh, at all the schools that high level. So I just find that there's a little bit of hypocrisy here and I got to call it out again two years later because it's the same people advocating for the eliminating of this elimination of screens that send their children to screen schools. It, it, it's, and, and I admit, I send my, uh, my, my youngest son goes to an un, unscreened school. It's a, it's a zone local elementary school. My oldest son goes to um, specialized high school and my uh, oldest son goes to a, um, a screened district two school. So I, I, I but I, I don't, take other positions, I mean, I'm just happy that I had those options in the first place. And I feel that sending my children to those schools gave each of them the best education that they, that, that, that they have. So I want to replicate that model and I want every parent to feel that the, the, the lowest form performing school in District 2 is as good as the best performing school. But it just, what do we do? How do we get to that? But we, we keep on focusing again on eliminating screens, but then sending our children to screen school. So I, I just want to call it out. Okay, are we, we are still um, open for comments on the screening moratorium resolution. If we don't have any more member comments. Hey, Maude, I, do not... have one, I do have one final comment. Um, and I just want to kind of go back. We had a long conversation, I think, um, are aligned or, you know, within this general conversation about screening, but we started this night with a simple question, which is, do we believe that the current screening process fairly assesses our children, right? Because that is the heart of it. And, and through this um, resolution, the co-sponsors pointed out several design flaws and implementation flaws. And, I think if 
we ignore those, we are ignoring what the heart of screening is. And the heart of screening is that it tells us nothing meaningful about a child's potential. It tells us nothing meaningful about a 10 year old's potential. But yet we're so obsessed with labeling and sorting kids that we're willing to overlook all of these issues and embrace a flawed system for no apparent reason. If you can't see the flaws in this current system, then I am, I mean, we have conversations all the time and everyone agrees to these flaws, that they see the flaws, the problems in screening, the inability to assess students across these areas, but yet we want to keep this system in place. So my question again goes back to this council. Are you confident that our current system can make meaningful distinctions among students. I think Vincent wanted to speak. I'm going to go to Vincent Hom, our CEC member. Um, yes, so kind of coming off of your question, if we we're to adopt the moratorium, what would take its place? What do you propose either uh, as an interim moratorium measure or permanently? What's, what is your proposal? Eric. Yes, sorry, one second. <laughs> um, so, you know, obviously we're at a unique point right now because um, we don't have grades for next year, we don't have test scores, we don't have attendance. So all of the items that we've used for screening are not there. So for me, um, I am comfortable um, with the community exploring how, what, what they think should be in its place. Right. I mean, for me, I just don't see why we continue to perpetuate a system that we know is flawed. So it's just as irresponsible to continue to perpetuate the system that we know is flawed as opposed to thinking about a new system. So for me, I want the recognition that this system is broken and flawed and doesn't work. And I don't want to subject one more student to it. Oops, I unmute myself. I'm going to take this moment to reiterate our earlier call. I know it was now almost four hours ago to have decorum in the chat. Um, I know after many hours of listening and paying attention, um, it does get tough to remember where we were four hours ago, but we were talking about the importance of making sure that our community spoke to each other with respect. Um, so I'd like to do that. I'd like to um, make one comment, and it's, it follows up to some extent on what Robin and Violet were saying. Uh, I wanted to respond to both of them, but then also really what Vincent said to Eric, which is this. For all the folks who say we need to get rid of screens, there's, from, from what I see, um, well, one, let me say preliminarily, I agree with some of the points that Eric makes about the lack of transparency and that if we're going to screen children, we should do it in a careful, thoughtful way so that parents can um, rely on a system being um, well run and um, honestly and carefully run. Uh, that being said, for all the reasons that I said before, I think right now we have a system with more positives than negatives in terms of the good schools uh, that parents like and want and we should aim to replicate the things that work as opposed to tear down the schools that work. Um, but with all that being said, I don't hear anyone when you say, let's get rid of all our screen schools. I never hear from anyone other than somehow magically by mixing up students in the right, in a different composition, that all of a sudden everybody will get a better education. Um, and I, I don't, it, it has never been presented to me in a way that I find convincing, obviously. Um, and I'll also say to Robin's point about how um, that the, the, um, the effort to get IEP classes and ICT classes established in schools had a resistance, right? And some people have uh, celebrate that model and think that it's very wonderful. Other people are wary of it. But I will say this, as someone who um, now has had children three kids almost go through an elementary school system. I've had kids in and out of ICT classes and two kids go through middle schools. There are enormous challenges to our teachers by having children who are at a very different range. I said at my last SLT meeting, 
I sat with a group of parents, one of whom said, parent with a child with an IEP who said to the principal, we're sometimes up until 10 o'clock at night. Like this remote learning is brutal. It's so hard and I'm not feeling the support that I need. And the principal replied, you know, I have other parents calling me up and saying, my kids are done with their school day in 90 minutes and they're done and they're, you know, it's too easy. We need more work. We need more um, challenging work for our kids. Setting up teachers and administrators in this difficult thing where they have to meet the needs of kids in the same class who have such a different range of abilities is hard. It's challenging. And the folks that say they want to group kids together by ability more um, are sometimes making very valid educational points. And I wish we could engage a little more in the honest discussion about how um, grouping kids in different ways based on education, not based on race, based on education, can have valuable education benefits. And it seems to me it's almost always impossible to have that conversation because folks won't take at face value the arguments that, um, that screening kids or grouping kids together by proficiency levels has value in an education setting. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I see people in, in the chat are not, not um, not going with my, oh, maybe we well, but, but I also think, though, that that totally disregards the fact that current, in the current system, even if you, if you put um, lots of other issues aside, you can't be an, an insane mathematician and an okay writer and, and get into a, a, a whatever they call top level screen school. That's unacceptable. No, Emily, that's a great example of, I happen to think, and I have promoted that, certain schools should say, we're going to design our rubric to screen for kids who do really well in math, particularly for boys. And I've talked about this before. There are boys who get great test scores. There are girls who get these test scores too, but there are sometimes more boys who do really well on math exams, but they're always kind of just your average ELA student. And those kids get dragged down because that there don't they we don't have rubrics that allow kids to shine in one area or the other. I agree with you. That means you adjust the screens in one school. If one school says we want to focus on kids who do really well in this area versus kids who do well in this area, that's a legitimate screening technique, right? Like that's a legitimate way in which to screen kids. You can agree or disagree with screens in general, but if you're going to have them, let's implement them in smart, thoughtful ways. So yeah, I agree with you. Kids should be able to be stellar mathematicians, just like you can be a stellar um, dancer or singer and do an audition. You should be a stellar mathematician and have a school that respects that skill and that value and that um, ability to exceed and excel. There's nothing wrong with that. Same thing in being a, a, a great writer um, or having a different academic strength. And, you know, I'm not saying this is what works for all million kids in the city. Different districts can do it differently. Again, we really should listen to the District 2 parents. Yes, but currently, I would just add. Unfortunately, the screens allow for what ends up happening is, is this. It's all one thing in one area. And then when you reverse that, as Robin rightly pointed out, you have, you know, what parents consider to be bad schools with a certain you know, it, it just, it's, it is not working. And to acknowledge that it, you know, I, I just don't see how we can sort of sit here now and say that we couldn't do that, that these incredible teachers who we laud at every turn, who I personally think are amazing, can't, you know, or that we couldn't within the school say, okay, there's a breakout group. We, they, we currently do that at, a, at an elementary school level and it works quite well. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot of energy getting put into sorting 10 year olds and assessing their potential. And, and the heart of this resolution asks the basic question of, can we actually ascertain or discern anything about a 10 year old and their potential from the information we have? And I think when you look at this resolution, the clear answer is we can't. So the question is, why are we spending all this time sorting kids? Right? Let's focus on learning. Okay. First, if you want to focus on learning, now I want to say something oh, because okay. we, we're leaving the biggest screen of, of them all, and that's called age. So you, you, you love to, to, you don't want to sort, uh, but you want to sort by screen, by age. So the grades, the screen, that's always going to be in place. So we can have 
we can have a very differentiated um, learning, uh, we, uh, difference of abilities, and that's fine. But we, we, we don't care about proficiency. We don't care about outcomes. We're just going to, whatever their age is, we're just going to group them in that. And that's what you want. And, and, and you don't want to look to proficiency. You don't want to look to, are these kids learning? So that doesn't matter to you. Uh, and, but let's just put them by age. And, and, let, and, and that's the biggest screen. So we're, we're leaving up the, the one screen together. Uh, uh, but let's eliminate everything else. That's what you want. You want one big lottery. Uh, and, and not outcomes. Sad. It's really sad. It's ten ten. Can we have a vote, or are we going to have circular we debates going we on? We have to have to uh, move on. Um, but the budget uh, one's the last one, right? Uh, no, I have another one, but I'm going to be okay. super short. Nobody needs to talk about it. So we can go on to Shino's budget resolution. Shino. Um, I'm not sure how much more to say other than what I shared with you and what Council Member Kalos and um, Senator Harvey Epstein talked about, not Senator or Assemblyman. I could say just a couple things, and it, I'm just being realistic about it. That th I mean, we could all say we don't want cuts, and we don't. I know nobody wants cuts in education, but to be realistic, the amount of money coming into the city and the state is going to be drastically lower because of the situation we're in. We're talking about, and don't forget how big of the budget education is. So they have to cut some of the education budget, right? And I agree with looking at certain things in that respect, but to think that it's not going to be cut at all, I think is disingenuous. I mean, we have people fleeing, you want to do, Harvey mentioned the wealth tax, right? Uh, in order to be subject to a wealth tax, you would actually have to be a New York City or New York State resident. Uh, the richest people are not in New York City or New York State right now, and they do it by day counting. So you can get rid of that. Commercial real estate is going to drop out. So taxes from that are gone. Uh, commercial rent taxes are gone. There are many sources of revenue that just aren't there. Corporate estimated payments are dropping. So to, to me, you need to deal with the reality that money is not, it's not all going to be there. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's what the situation is. Um, let me okay. just offer, can I just offer the perspective of why we're doing the resolution? Yeah. We're not here to figure out the fiscal crisis. Part of the resolution, the point of the resolution is if we don't make noise, then the governor is going to gut the budget. We're gonna get a cut anyway. Even if we mobilize every single family in this city saying don't cut, we're gonna get cuts. That's a fact. But if we don't advocate, then they're gonna cut left and right. We're not gonna be able to complain. We have to take a stand on this knowing that we're not gonna get what we're asking for. But to do nothing, we're going to deserve every cut we get if we don't do something. That's this fair. is not about solving the fiscal problems. It's about standing on the notion that public education is important and they should really think carefully about budget cuts to education. We're not naive here. We know the situations we're in. Some of us have lost jobs. But that's all the more reason we have to make a noise. Okay, we are going to move on to uh, I, Ushma. Is there a second public session with any participants? How many? Just one. Okay, and let's. It is Hans Storer. Hans Storer, one minute for our second public session post resolution. Uh, so if you're here, Hans. He is, and he's unmuted. Okay, go. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Hans Storr. I'm a dis District 2 parent and uh, elected member of Lab Middle School Parent Association. And um, I missed the beginning of the session, so I don't even know what I'm commenting on regarding the resolution. I searched for it diligently in the CEC website, but I cannot find it. So I think that this um, points to what is a very flawed format for these public meetings. Um, 
but I did want to say, I might uh, say something about um, screened uh, uh, screens in the uh, education. And um, why are we even talking about these radical overhauls to the admissions during an unprecedented time of social crisis? Why, when tens of thousands of families are mourning loved ones' deaths, when families are just trying to survive, when families are fearing fearful economic dislocations and uncertainty and physical, mental, and psychological stresses, why during such a period of crisis are we even talking about an anti-academic educational agenda that one faction in the city has been pushing for several years, as we know, way before COVID even appeared on the scene? And why does one faction think that it is right or fair to take advantage of this period of profound social dislocation to address these issues? Why indeed, as our education chancellor touchingly put it, never let a good crisis go to waste. Many parents and citizens in District 2 find the attempt to profoundly change the education system during a time of profound dislocation and upheaval without proper parent and community input at an in-person public meeting to be offensive, frankly despicable and illegitimate. The notion that to admit, eliminate admission standards lifts up the underprivileged is false logic. To eliminate admission standards will not lift any students up, rather it will drag everyone down to the lowest quality and the lowest common denominator. Admission standards based on academic criteria offer students something to strive for. Without something to strive for, children will have no motivation to learn. Without academic criteria or academic standards in education, schools become meaningless. Those were uh, just some of my thoughts on the admissions debate. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. We are now going to go to a vote on our resolutions. So. Let's take them one at a time. I think we need a motion on the Info Hub resolution. A motion. I'll second. Okay. Can you, can, for clarity, can you state what the motion is before somebody seconds it? So we I know motion for, one, for 135. To approve. Yeah. To approve. Okay, to thank approve. you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Jennifer, I thank second you. that one. Always keeping our. Um, our meetings run smoothly. Tom has made a motion to approve uh, resolution 135. Ushma has seconded it. Uh, Vincent, can you unmute yourself and call names and have members vote? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Ben Morden, how do you Our vote? Ben, are you here? I, I abstain. Okay. Uh, Eric Goldberg. Yeah. Maud Marin. I vote no. Uh, okay. Let's see. Emily Hellstrom. Yes. Robin Broshi. Yes. Shino Tanakawa. Yes. Edward Irizari. Yes. Who am I missing? Uh, Violet Becker. Violet. <laughs> I'll text her. I will. We'll find Violet. Um, uh, all right. Uh, I'm. I'm voting no. Oh, Violet's here. Okay. Violet. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm voting no. Who do we have? Left? I'm voting no also. Uh, oh, Len Silverman. Yes. Okay. Is that everybody? Nope. You've got. I'm saying yes. Or I guess if well, I you, yeah, you, 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 it. yeah, you already uh, seconded it. So I assume you said yes. Can you part or not? <laughs> I, 
Vincent, what do we yes. have? I think so. we have six yeses. Is that correct? Yeah. Six or seven. Jennifer, you can second a motion even if you don't want to support the resolution, right? That's correct. Okay, so we just want there to be a vote. That would that would be, that would, that would be illogical, but yes, you could. Well, but you could believe in the principle that I, that we should vote on things, okay, right? So. Well, then in both regards, I both <laughs> the principle on voting for. Yes. Now care what Ushma says. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay. Did I leave anyone out on that one? I don't we think have so. one abstention, three no's, and seven yeses. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now let's move on to the process audit resolution. One, I make a motion to approve. I second. All right, so that was Eric and Shino, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and both of you are voting yes, I assume. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Ushma? Yes. Uh, Tom? Yes. Maud? Uh, I am abstaining. Len? Len Silverman? Oh, you're muted. Uh, abstain. Ben Morden? Abstain. Emily Halstrom? Yes. And I'm the last, well, second to last vote. Edward, uh, Edward Irizarry? Uh, I uh, vote yes. This is 136, right? Correct. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I abstain. And Violet? Well, also me. <laughs> Robin Broshi votes yes. Oh, sorry, Robin. That's okay. I can't find Violet. Okay, Violet's so. Violet's here. Um, I'm gonna mute her. Violet's here. Someone on her, someone who's. I just unmuted. Oh, wait. Well, I'm trying to unmute her. Can you Sorry. hear? Unmuted. Violet, oh. you're unmuted. You want okay, to vote 136? Yes. Okay, Violet votes yes. I'm going to count that resolution passes. So we've passed Info Hub and Process Audit. Moving on to Support of Funding Resolution 139, the resolution that Shino uh entered i make, I make a, mo a motion to approve the, the resolution number 139 and i second that we now go to a vote and i vote yes vincent okay and that the second was from ushma is that right yep and i vote yes okay um so uh eric yes ben no uh tom uh, okay, uh, Edward? Yes. Maud? Yes. Uh, Emily? Yes. Robin? Yes. Uh, I'm going to vote yes. Uh, okay, who do we have left? One, two, three. I vote yes. Len? All right. So, and Violet. Yes. Yes. Did you hear yes. that? Yes. Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. By my count, that one. Well, that's our third last resolution tonight. We're moving on to the screening moratorium resolution. Okay. All right. Uh, does, is someone going to make a motion? Sure. I make a motion to approve the resolution and vote yes. I second, and I vote yes. Harmless. All right, Ushma? No. Maud? No. <laughs> uh, Emily? Snake. Yes. Robin? Yes. Uh, ben? No. 
Tom? Abstain. Okay. Len? No. I'm sorry, Emily, did you vote? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, who did I leave out, aside from myself? You left me out. Oh, Edward, sorry. It's, it's getting late. So. Uh, Edward, what is your vote? No. Uh, I'm also going to vote no. And Violet. Yay. Is this for all of them together? I'm confused. No, this is the screening moratorium uh, resolution. Oh, yes. For me. Okay. All right. So there's, does not pass. Moving on to parent input for admission policy resolution. I make a motion to accept the resolution. Second. Who's that second from? Tom. Okay, and, uh, and you both are voting yes. Okay, Eric Goldberg. No. Emily Hallstrom? No. Uh, ben Morden? Yes. Uh, hey. uh, Ar Edward Irizari? This is 141, right? Uh, the parent input on... Uh, yes. Yes, 141. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Len? Len? Yes. Yeah. Chino? No. Uh, Robin? No. Violet. Um, Violet? I'm not familiar with this one, so I'm going to just Okay. Who is there? We have someone who is not muted. It's a little... Oh, it's, it's, it's me. I think it's Vincent, yeah. Vincent, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I have to vote, and I'm going to... Uh, the parent input, uh, I'm voting yes. Okay. I think we got one more. Uh, who did I leave out? Me, I'm voting yes. Okay, Ushma, sorry. Ushma votes yes. Okay, so it's four no's and seven yeses. We have another pass resolution that is four pass resolutions. I don't believe, sorry I, moved, sorry, I moved us to uh, vote before. What I wanted to do before we move to the vote is say that with regard to the K through 12 resolution, I just don't think there's enough time to discuss it in a meaningful way. And I wanted to move to, that we adjourn it to the next calendar meeting so that we can have uh, a thoughtful discussion about it. Can anyone second that motion, please? I second. Tom um, seconds it, so we're going to adjourn that resolution to the next calendar meeting. That means we have um, four out of five of these resolutions have passed. We will post them. Uh, I want to commend all of our council members because we had we shared different opinions and not all of us agreed with each other, not all along traditional lines. We've had a little bit of uh, conversation that's substantive, and I think that's a good thing. Um, do any, before we adjourn for the evening, do any council members have anything further that they, and I want to thank everybody, I, you know, amazingly, there's still 100 people on this call uh, for the folks who hung out, who listened, who spoke up in the public session and almost kept the chat in, a, in the state of decorum that we'd like to see it. For those of you who did, to compliment the folks who did behave appropriately, speak appropriately, or not chat at all, unless they had something nice to say, thank you for that like to focus on the folks who did it right. Um, More just technicality. We had a, a motion that was seconded. We all have to say up and down right. vote. Oh, sorry, that is correct. Um, Thank you, Sheena. Sheena You're welcome. You can do a voice, yes. It's, yeah, it's only in favor say aye. 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 I think that's unanimous that no one wants to stick around and talk about a lengthy resolution. Not surprised by that one, one of our unanimous moments. Thank you all for being here tonight. If nothing else from anybody else, we'll say good night and we'll see you all again sometime soon. Good night. Night, folks.